We're live. Welcome, everybody, to Critical Media Theory and Digital Literacy at Theory Underground. I am David McCarricker, and Anne is also here with us. If you want to say hello to everybody. Hello to everybody. <laughs> there we go. So today, we were going to just kind of dive right in. We were going to start the, the second year of CMT off, um, getting into the comfort crisis and Lacan. I was going to give an introduction to Lacan, and I was going to do it the same way I just did for CDT with being in time, where I did basically you know, a year's worth of teaching being in time and really 10 years of studying that text all condensed down into one lecture, trying to give you the whole book in two and a half hours. Um, I was going to do that with Lacan, but I decided let's not dive in so deep. Let's not go too crazy just yet. Let's take, let's take it a little easy and instead make this something that will uh, be more of a recap of where we've been. Because I think when I originally, actually, no, I know that when I was originally giving CMT lectures with Anne last year, the idea was a lot more like, oh, you know, we're going to have like this basic syllabus, we're going to go through it, and then we'll rinse and repeat it with a new cohort every year. But we don't want to rinse and repeat it because there's all this other stuff that we want to get into. As I just mentioned, there's the Lacan. There's also Marx. We never really got into Marx. There's other McLuhan works we never really got into. We never got into Alul. We never got into uh, Siegler. We never got, there's a bunch of uh, really important theorists and uh, other texts. One really big theme of this year is going to be authenticity versus profilicity, right? Hans Georg Mueller has this book called Your Profile in You. And it's about profilicity, which is uh, an idea that kind of counteracts our assumptions about authenticity. So that's all really cool stuff that we're looking forward to getting into. But also, there's a lot of new people here, a lot of new faces. Uh, a lot of people have joined Theory Underground since last year. Uh, and so we just kind of want to introduce ourselves and also what what we've done so far, the sort of ground that we've covered. Uh, this is a private session for people who have signed up at, at, at for at least the Theory Underground website, if not Patreon or subscribers. Um, but it's going to go public. We're going to be releasing this in a few days on the YouTube channel so that people who've gotten involved in the last few months on that side are also going to be able to see. So hello, everybody wave to people who are watching us in the future. Hi, YouTube. Um, we're putting this out there so that you'll... <laughs> we're putting this out there so that you can all kind of get a, a sense for what's happened before. All of the critical media theory lecture sessions that have happened so far have remained private. Uh, I may release them into the public at some point, but there's also a lot of editing work that I kind of would want to put into those before they do go public. And uh, so for right now, uh, most people uh, on the channel have not seen any of the CMT content, except for people who might've seen during one epic marathon live stream that I did with Nance, we played, uh, I think it was like, what, month five, where I talked about Emmanuel Levinas uh, and uh, the other being on call, uh, as you know, the other, the other human being being on call verse in this sort of Heideggerian sense of being on call, which is to say in framed, always at our disposal, which is obviously what happens with smartphones versus the other having a face in this Levinasian sense, which gets a lot closer to like the voice and the way that a person's voice can really change everything. And uh, how we get a little overly neurotic when we're stuck on screens and in text. And sometimes we don't really know how to read a situation anymore. And the best way to break through it is to actually make a phone call. And that sometimes, you know, Zoom's great, 
Zoom is great, uh, Snapchat, whatever, some kind of video uh, conferencing way of communicating with people can be fantastic, but also it can get in the way of the Levinasian face. The face of the other, with, with, square, with uh, scare quotes, the face of the other gets in the way of the face, which is to say like the their actual humanity, their actual potential personhood, right? So if that rings a bell for anybody, then that's because uh, that part of CMT was played out over the actual uh, live stream at one point, but it hasn't been published as a standalone video. And so if you missed it, no worries. Um, with that, I kind of want to uh, hand it over here for a minute to Anne to talk about um, how we got into this, how this kind of came about. And th then after she does, she does that for a little bit. Um, well, actually, and I don't know, do you, do you want to do that from down there and then also transition into, uh, the stuff that you've covered or should we just, okay. I, uh, we, we haven't thought this out obviously too much. Here's, here's what we'll do. Um, for a few minutes and can kind of share out like how this course came about. And then I might add a few thoughts onto that and then she'll come up here and she's going to give an actual lecture in front of the whiteboard. And then I'll give my little lecture in front of the whiteboard and then we'll have a Q and a, um, and also in that Q and a people who have been involved with CMT before, such as Nance and AO, uh, as well as George will be encouraged to, or in Philip as well, of course, will all be encouraged to, um, talk about their final projects and, or, uh, favorite CMT lectures and maybe add something that the two of us that we forget to talk about. Um, so with that, yeah, uh, this kind of came about because, uh, Anne and I, we love to talk about these kinds of things. And so with that, I'll just kind of turn it over to her. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, I can't remember like any certain day where we were like, this needs to happen. But I think in general, Dave and I tend to think and talk pretty critically about just the things going on in our lives. And obviously one thing that is and has been a big part of our lives, especially my own life being um, closer to the Gen Z side of the millennial side than the other side. Um, I had a smartphone or I, I had social media from a pretty early age. Um, and just thinking about and reflecting on the ways that that you know, I could say it nicely and say the way that that shaped my experience and the struggles that it gave me, or I could just say bluntly, like the way it fucked me up. Um, and it's fucked me up <laughs> pretty, pretty hard. Um, having that from, from a very early age adolescent, as an adolescent girl. Um, and so Dave and I, and just our own kind of phone use and, and phone habits and, and always thinking about, ah, oh, like this is such a struggle. How do we get better? at this and kind of knowing of these more popular, you know, New York Times bestselling type of books um, that exist out there, these kind of self-help type books within the sphere of thinking about social media and technology, all of that, knowing that that exists and where to even start with that, you know, Dave having some background on more philosophical works of technology, and I think just just the, the conversation and the struggle culminated into, hey, let's actually do a course on this. Critical media theory, I think, was kind of not necessarily the main part of Dave's thesis, but I think was a big part of kind of Dave's thesis work and a little bit of Waypoint, the first book. And so that was already a topic in a field that Dave had been working on, developing, thinking about. Um, but with something that is as pressing or important as like our technology use and not just like our screens and social media, but news and news media and the way that that functions in our world and in our politics. And then beyond that, uh, like AI and virtual reality and just kind of the big technological issues that are seemingly happening and coming upon us so fast and changing so fast and radically changing our, I mean, our brains and, and how we function in a way that is 
we would argue, different than other technologies. Um, and obviously, every technology is going to make its changes to society. Like, kind of, I'll get into the first book that we read um, in month one last time about like the television and how that kind of shaped society and, and the medium of that and what that meant. Um, but we want, so, so Dave had that knowledge. I have this like sociological background, um, social science background. And so with a field as big as critical media theory and technology, we thought, okay, we can teach, you know, philosophy and we can teach the big ideas, but we could also actually take like these popular texts or more accessible texts that maybe more people have read, um, that are potentially like less rigorous, but still give more of a kind of a broad cultural perspective and combine the two and pair, you know, one more philosophical dense text or selection of a text and one of these more accessible books each month so that we can root our and base the changes that we want to make in our own lives with technology. So we can base that in a, a big idea, not just, oh, making change, for making change's sake, which is hard to do if we don't have like a value or an idea of why that change is important. And so that's where kind of the philosophical and theoretical side comes in. And so, yeah, it's just, you know, an attempt to be rigorous in thinking about technology use so that hopefully the changes that we make in the areas with technology use or social media use or phone use that affects us negatively in our lives, hopefully we can take, you know, what we do here in critical media theory and digital literacy have this cohort of people who hold us accountable and who challenge our ideas and assumptions and we can come out the other side going yeah no i have a better relationship to technology it does not interfere with my life as much as it did before and so that i know is was our main goal dave probably has some more thoughts and then and then we'll switch over to to my side Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Anne. And so what I would add to that is just that, um, as Anne indicated in my first book, Waypoint, uh, the second chapter is called, I think it's called, uh, virtual in framing. Let's, let's double check here. Is it called virtual in framing? Yeah, virtual in framing, Heidegger, Levinas, and critical media theory. And actually, critical media theory was in the subtitle of that work. And at the time that I was talking about it, I had looked it up and I tried to find uh, syllabuses on the subject uh, or, you know, on this field, right? And come up empty handed. There's like a, a book you can find on Amazon called Critical Media Theory and Black Mirror. And it's basically, um, well, it's not really what I was expecting, right? It's not like what I, uh, it's, it, there's no real like, uh, basis in the field of critical media theory. It's, it's kind of just say, it, it's kind of just like, oh, let's do like this kind of standard, like how are black people represented in this show? And let's, you know, that, like that kind of like, we have some identity politics. Now we're going to like, look at this show and then we're going to like, talk about it or whatever, which is all great. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, actually we plan on bringing a real, uh, critical media theorist or someone who teaches critical media theory in a real, you know, academic environment to come talk about, uh, the Stuart Hall kind of approach to critiquing that, that sort of representational, um, way of analyzing, uh, films, right? So we, we'll, we'll end up getting that this year, which is going to be fantastic because we found out on tour, uh, when we, when our, uh, tour in September for the books went through LA, the, the main host, uh, uh, for our tour, like she helped, uh, organize so much of the stuff. And she's a good friend of Todd McGowan's, uh, Jennifer Friedlander. She actually teaches critical media theory and she's, uh, she's really into Stuart Hall. And she said that, yeah, that, that he, his whole approach really undermines the standard, sort of American leftist 
or, you know, a little progressive sort of rad lip kind of way of analyzing films where you're just looking at this sort of level of uh, explicit representation, who's represented, who's not represented, how are they represented, how is how is a stereotype being depicted here? Um, and uh, so Stuart Hall poses a, a challenge to people who are approaching films that way. We, we, we look forward to having Jennifer Freelander, like gonna she's going to join us for a private session. It's not going to be live streamed. It's not going to be public. Um, and we'll get into it um, and have our, you know, in, insofar as we might kind of bring that to film still when we watch them, um, she's going to call that all into question. So that'll probably be a mashup that we do with the Theory Underground Film Club. But that is not critical media theory where I'm coming from, right? And so I had this conversation with Jennifer Friedlander. I was like, I don't even think about like this whole analyzing a film for like what's represented or whatever. Like, that's not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about Marshall McLuhan, Karl Marx, and Martin Heidegger. I'm thinking about Paul Virilio and Jacques Ellul. I'm thinking about Stiegler, right? I'm thinking about uh, these people who write these one to three volume works on technology and media, people who spent their entire lives thinking about mediums as opposed to, oh, what are we shown in the media today, right? And so, like, in a certain sense, we maybe really should just get obnoxious to the academy that has failed to really take this field seriously by calling it critical mediums theory. I, I say that's obnoxious because obviously grammatically it's a mistake. And of course, media is already the plural of medium. But the meaning of these words has been lost. And I'll get, a, I'll get into that a little bit more in my lecture. But Marshall McLuhan is the father of media theory. All right. So Marshall McLuhan, father of media theory, but not the father of critical media theory. Why? Well, because he never really took Marx seriously. He never really took continental philosophy uh, seriously. He never really got super into uh, sociology. He was very eclectic and he was uh, groundbreaking and arguably he couldn't have succeeded in doing all of the things that he did if it wasn't for how he bracketed out all of those other things. And he probably bracketed out a lot of those things because he met some traditional worldview Marxists in his area. You know, the international Marxist tendency, IMT, is very big out in McLuhan's neck of the woods. When they get together with their annual conference uh, today, like 500 people show up. Okay, you don't get 500 people showing up to Marxist conferences in the United States. So the, the, that area that sort of Toronto area of Canada that McLuhan is from, that there's a bigger presence of Marxism. But, but, but it's a worldview Marxism. It's a Trotskyist sort of Marxism. What does that mean? And why does that matter? Well, I'll do a whole lecture on worldview Marxism versus critique of political economy. And what this word critique actually gets at and why it's a word that we have a sort of fidelity to, right? Critique is not just, oh, me no likey. Critique is not just, oh, that bad. Uh, and it's not just this worldview Marxist, oh, well, who does that serve? Which is, you know, a great question that Lenin asks. Of course, we should always think that question, who does this serve? Of course. But it's, it goes much, much, much further than that. And I'll get into that, like I said, in my lecture. But for right now, um, there was just a stunning lack uh, in academia and also just in content online for critical media theory. And so um, I, was, I was thinking about that back when I was working on that piece. Um, and then there were all of these conversations we were having about books like uh, uh, Reclaiming Conversation. And uh, Anne had not read Amusing Ourselves to Death, but I knew she was going to love it. And Digital Minimalism, she loved that book. I love that book. We were both thinking about all, all these different little life hacks and ways of changing our mentality about our media and, or, and, and, and how, to, how to get uh, distance, especially from our smartphones, right? Um, recently in a classroom discussion, Anne was there. Um, she, she sat in on one of my classes at the, at the university. and. Uh, it was, you know, 
when the smartphone conversation came up, everybody starts talking at once. Everybody's talking. Everyone's excited. They're all talking about how addicted they are to their phones and how and different things that they've tried to do to to use them less. Okay. Uh, I don't know if these are Zoomers or Generation Y or whatever the fuck. I don't care. The point is, is college students today, right? Uh, people between the ages of 18 and 20, for the most part, today are uh, most excited to talk about how their phones are driving them crazy. And so uh, for the last you know, 15 years, you tend to get the most pushback from this uh, topic, uh, not from younger people who all know that it's problematic, but from older people who adopted late, late in their life, and now they're proud that they adopted because they're hip, right? So it's parents usually who are like defensive because the parents were against the phones and they were against how it was being used, but then they finally got on Facebook to stay in touch with their grandkids. And now they're like, you know what? I'm hip. And actually it's great. And then of course you have this weird phenomenon where uh, the most Bible believing people in our lives are distracted on their phones in church. And Anne will get into that in her lecture here. Um, is actually, and if you want to come get set up, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, uh, turn it over to you in a minute here and, uh, and switch the everything over to the, to the other view on the camera. But I just wanted to say that the, the, it was, it was those kinds of conversations that we were having combined with the realization that this, we wanted to experiment with a new way of doing a course at Theory Underground. And that's because, you know, we would get a really cool cohort of people for the idea of the university or for the professional managerial class consciousness and ideology or for uh, Slavoj Zizek's for they know not what they do or for uh, Martin Heidegger's being in time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We were getting really cool cohorts of people, but then they take the course and then they go on with their life. And then maybe they come to a live stream every once in a while or some kind of an event that's like a bonus lecture like this. And we were like, well, we got to have some kind of like a minimum, um, a, a time energy minimum way of staying involved at Theory Underground. And so Cadell and I, Cadell with Philosophy Portal and I, you know, me with Theory Underground, we started experimenting with uh, live events in our own ways. But, but part of it was just kind of like we wanted to make it so that people could show up on a rout routine basis, but also not have like this sense that they're missing everything going on if they don't come to every freaking thing. And so critical media theory became the first thing that we do once per month. Now, the lecture session is once per month. The discussion section is also once per month. So you could say that it's twice per month, but the discussion section is optional. You don't have to come to it. If you really want to just be getting in on, and, or, or you could do it the other way around. You could come to the discussions once per month and watch the lectures on your own time because those are available on demand. Um, but if you want to be a part of a research cohort while you're a busy person uh, and, and get to know the people at Theory Underground, CMT is the, at this point, uh, the, the most reliable uh, way to do that. And so originally it was just a course that was going to be six months, but because we were getting so much out of it and we really liked the model and we had so much more stuff that we wanted to go through, it became this this thing that's like, no, it's just going to be on the second Sunday of every month for all time. And, sh and sure, like we need a break from lecturing after six months, but that's when we take three months to do student presentations, right? And at this point, AO did a student presentation, Philip did a student presentation, Nance did a student presentation, several other people gave student presentations who aren't able to be here right now. And those are great months as well. Um, now we've also brought in a workshop component. You should have all hopefully at this point gotten an email about that. Uh, let me know if you didn't. Uh, follow me up with an email. Let me know if you want to attend that. But basically there's a writing workshop component for people who want to take their presentations from CMT or other related courses um, and uh, develop that into a proposal for the conference that can then become a presentation that can then become a paper, that can then become a submission potentially in one of the anthologies because we have several anthologies in the works and we'll get into that on March 23rd at 5 p.m. CET. I sent out the wrong time in that email, so, you know, go double check. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be sending a follow-up on that soon. But with that, uh, 
I'm going to turn it over to Anne here. Oh, one sec. Yeah. She's going to just actually sit right here. So I don't even have to do anything. With that, uh, put your hands together. Welcome up, Anne. Ooh. Yes. No. So they all know that you're canceled. That's true. <laughs> What's new? What's new here? Um, let me pull up notes. Let me find. Okay, so what I will be doing today is kind of going through and giving us a recap of not only the texts that we read that I presented on in the last cohort of on the more like popular, accessible text side. But really, I'll be trying to highlight some of the main points and the big ideas that I think are important going into um, this next cohort for those who were not there. There we go. Okay. So, let's do it. Um, our cohort began, uh, obviously with Dave giving a presentation on Marshall McLuhan and Marx and talking about, you know, this, this, what critical media theory means, putting the critical into the critical media theory and the book that made the most sense to pair with that, um, was Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death. And so this book was an expansion on kind of the McLuhan project and the McLuhan idea of the medium is the message. Let me find out when this book came out. Ourself to death. It came out in 1985, first published. Um, and it was around this time that the television was really, you know, picking up in the United States. And so this book was all about um, this... This idea how the of how the medium can change our our brain function can just change society can change you know the ways in which we're interacting um, and the the book really starts out very ominously in the sense that he says you know a lot of people think we're living in in an Orwellian society right now where you know Big Brother is the is the big fear society has become you know like dictatorial. But he says that it's actually the Huxleyan view in Brave New World where society has become a burlesque. It's just become a show for entertainment. And that should scare us more than the Orwellian vision, according to him. Um, according to Postman, that is. He says that at that time, you know, Las Vegas was kind of like the American city. And what does that say about us as America, us as society, more specifically about the mediums, you know, you will use our, our term mediums, the mediums, specifically the medium of television, TV, that has become so popular in the United States. Um, so throughout the book, he really sets up very nicely kind of a, a historical picture of, okay, where was America pre-television in this typographic age, right? There was this high literacy rate in New England, the 1600s um in you know, uh after you know early 1700s and, and throughout the 1700s there was this big epistemological shift towards books and text as being the main medium right at the time you know america itself was founded by intellectuals who were writing 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 and so just it was just something everyone you know as as time went on after you know america was established as a country most Americans knew how to read, had a high literacy rate. That was just the way that people got their information. So in terms of thinking about how a medium shapes a culture, what that meant is that, you know, the general public could follow something like Lincoln-Douglas debates at the time. Like nowadays, you think, you know, college students can't even sit for five minutes in a lecture without having to look at their phone or send a Snapchat. Those Lincoln-Douglas debates were so long, they'd have an intermission after four or five hours, go, 
hey, everyone go home, get some dinner, then come back and we'll go for five more hours. Um, so that is just, you know, people had the capacity to do that, to follow that. Reading is just what people did to kind of stay in the know, to have some sort of cultural thing to talk about together. Like that, they just, that's just how it was. Um, Post-typographic era in the United States was kind of the telegraph, telegraphic area. And, and the way that that really changed society and kind of we start to see some of these similarities between, you know, the, the, the age of television and now today, like the age of social media as our medium or maybe smartphones as our medium um, was particularly the the influx of getting information that was not directly relevant to where we were living at the time, our neighbors. So now all of a sudden, you know, we, as an American, you could find out what was going on in Maine if you lived in Texas. Like, oh, great, I'm informed about that, but what can I actually do about that? Like, oh, if there was, there's bad weather in Maine right now and I live in Texas... Well, now I know that there's bad weather in Maine that doesn't really affect my day. And so this um, affects what Postman calls the information action ratio, which is, you know, the action that you are able to take based on the information that you get. And so in a telegraphic age where you're just getting all this information from all over, it's like, yes, you know of a lot of things, but the things that you know about don't actually affect the action that you were going to take in a given day. And so we think now it's like we are just getting bombarded with, oh, this is going on in Israel. This is going on in Ukraine. This is going on in this side of the country. There was a shooting here. There was a shooting here. There's this crisis going on here. And it's a lot to take in. And so, yeah, we can say, oh, we're informed citizens. You know, with the Telegraph, we are informed citizens. But to that information action ratio, Okay, well, I can give some money that I don't have to any one of these causes to help. Um, and this is what Postman called information glut. Just having like this overwhelming amount of information that we just don't even know what to do with. Like it's so overwhelming. We're just like, it's, it's gluttonous. It's, it's too much. It's excessive amounts of information. Um, and so when you take, the telegraph, this idea of just like getting a lot of information and, and being able to get information across state lines, across regions, plus like the idea of the photograph moving, you turn into a moving photograph and now we have like television and kind of this transformation of news from functional information to just decontextualized facts. It's just, here you go. Here's some information. Now this, now this. Now this, that information glut. Um, and so the rest of the book is just about the age of show business and the fact that show business is a business itself um, and the way that, you know, the profit that comes from keeping us entertained, keeping us watching the news at the time, um, that was kind of the main thing, the, the news and the way in which every other sphere of life got turned into something that could be shown on television. So religion and these big, like, tele televangelists, televangelists, I don't know how I'm saying that right, Um, who, so you would watch religion on, t like, religious sermons, big, you know, high-budget things on TV, and then, oh, let's take this break from Jesus to, you know, get an advertisement about this sugary cereal that'll give you diabetes or whatever. Oh, someone. Tell tell Van Jellico. Oh, and by the way, you can there give you. me you can give me a oh. co-host so that I can let people in. That, that way you don't have would to be great. Yeah. I forgot to okay. give it to Nance, sorry. Wow. Um there. Wait. Oh, you changed the name to Dave. I'm Yeah, um, ah, on the recording side, I think on the recording side, they don't see the name okay. problem, Make but everyone else has been seeing you as Dave this whole time. Yeah. Well, you all know that I'm not Dave, so. 
There we go. Problem solved. Um. Anyways, and so Postman, yeah, highlights the the problems that come in an age that is so where the main medium is television and how everything, religion, politics, even education, gets turned into just this entertainment stream. It's it's pure entertainment, emotional gratification. You're not really getting much else out of it with the, you know, exclusion of like, oh, some local news of like, oh, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? Oh, what should I wear? Oh, great. But you could get that from the newspaper. You get that from, you know, your neighbor who had the newspaper who tells you what the weather is every day. And so Postman is interesting because he just really thought, you know, the end of this book, he tells this story. You're like, oh, wow, you can really see the parallels of the problems that he saw with the age of television to the problems that we see now with, you know, social media, the age of TikTok, the age of smartphones. But he was almost optimistic in the sense that he thought, oh, well, just having awareness of the problem will make the problem better and we just need more education. Um, but clearly the, the technology kept developing and now we are where we are and we wouldn't be, you know, doing critical media theory if, if Postman and McLuhan were like, great, everything will just work out fine and the technology will not get any worse and it will not change us radically at all. Um, and so that was month one, amusing ourselves to death, kind of that um, expansion on McLuhan's project, talking about mediums and the ways that mediums affect us and our society. Month two, we had a really great book, um, Reclaiming Conversation by Sherry Turkle. I kind of forgot the... The presentation that I gave that month was called Homicidal Children, Chronically Online Adults, and Christians on Their Phones at Church, The Case for Solitude and Solicitude. Um, and so, right, this idea of solitude and solicitude. I know it's for those who have Waypoint, uh, Dave's first book. Dave talks about those in, like, the virtuous circle that Sherry Turkle uh, explains in her book. but. She makes the case throughout Reclaiming Conversation of, you know, what solitude is, why we're having a crisis of solitude, and why it's important. On the flip side, what is solicitude, why is it important, why we're having a crisis, and why solitude and solicitude kind of make this virtuous circle, why they're important for each other. Um, and so, you know, according to her, the virtuous circle between solitude and solicitude links conversation to the capacity for empathy and self-reflection. And so today, not only did Turkle see in her book, but today especially we're seeing just this crisis of people not actually ever getting to be alone with their own thoughts, away from the world, like at all. And I think part of it goes back to time energy. There's just, there's just simply not enough time and energy to have meaningful solitude in our, in our week, have time with ourselves to write, to reflect, to go on long, you know, walks in nature. Um, but also, social media has really gotten in the way of that. And I think young people are are really scared and really have a hard time with solitude simply because they don't actually have practice with it. Like we showed a video clip at the beginning of this lecture, I remember, um, in month two, where there was an interviewer just asking random people out in the world, like, is there anything scarier than being alone with your own thoughts? And all of them were like, oh my gosh, no, no, there's not. Like, I would, like, people in in, in Reclaiming Conversation, Turkle gives this example of how there were people, when they were given the choice between, like, spending 30 minutes in absolute silence or, like, shocking themselves, like, most of them chose to shock themselves rather than just, like, sit alone and think. And so it's this this big crisis. Um, and to her, it's, it's so much worse than just, oh, well, we don't have time, you know, to have a relationship with ourselves. but it then affects the way that we are with others. And so no time for solitude. She, she finds that it's creating this lack of empathy amongst young people. Um, she, she cites these, you know, various studies and talking to like school teachers, for example, where they're just seeing like this stark Lack of empathy amongst school children, not being able to, you know, understand the ways in which their own actions impact others, not, not being able to see the other, to be with the other, um, because they don't even have time with themselves. And so the, the three, you know, the homicidal children, 
was just to to really drive that point home and the fact that Dave and I, like in our lives, not necessarily directly in our lives, but we know of in miscellaneous, you know, spheres and relationships, three teenage girls who are like not like they're troubled, but like what teenage girl, teenage girl, teenage boy isn't, but they're like like concerningly troubled, like hom- like homicidal, like writing you know, very scary things in their journals, saying very scary things, wishing harm onto others, doing things that harm others, which is just so interesting because we would typically not think that a teenage girl would would do that. And I think that's just to drive home this crisis because at the same time, you know, we we love the the families and the people who have these daughters, but these daughters have zero restrictions on their technology use to our knowledge. They are Ironically on TikTok, um, okay, well, that's a lie. One of the girls that we know, it does have restrictions. Um, but even then, she was using YouTube to look up, like, how to make out with boys, and she's, like, 11. Um, and so there's just this, like, unrestricted use. These kids don't have unlimited access, and at the same time, they don't have the time to be with themselves. And, and why Turkle thinks that solitude you know, has this direct connection to empathy is because if you don't have the ability to recognize yourself as a person through that solitude, you know, building a stable sense of self, you're not going to be able to recognize others as a person, as an equal person to you. Um, and so for her, just having solitude is is kind of that fix at the same time not having true solicitude, which is, you know, genuine, uninterrupted time with others is also creating this problem is just creating this problem of, of connection and, and, and having relationships. Um, you know, she says that, or she cites all these studies that real conversations are not happening, happening, you know, we're always connected. Our phones give us this fake sense that we are hyper connected, but not actually developing relationships um there's even a study that she cites that having a phone if you're like get meeting up with someone face to face at a coffee shop for example and one of you just has your phone like sitting on the table face down the quality of the conversation is just going to be lower because of how you're functioned to think about the presence of that phone in which there could be an interruption oh i shouldn't go deeper because oh the the chance for an interruption the chance for you know, the person to stop paying attention to me is so high that there's no point in actually digging any deeper. Um, so that's, you know, one crisis she sees that we're, when we do spend time with others, there's so much technology kind of interfering, stopping us from seeing the other's face, from really being there with the other and hearing the other person. Um, families spending less time together. That's what a lot of her examples are in the book is, um, which are they're just like heartbreaking examples. You know, these kids like asking their parents, oh my gosh, dad, stop Googling and just talk to me. Um, and so that's the other crisis, the, the crisis of solicitude. And I, and I gave like, I gave example of like a chronically online adult, this YouTuber I used to watch who is just so online and has this parasocial relationship with her fans and films all three of her children and puts them on the internet from the day they were born as if oh, these are just my friends who I'm sharing to. And on the one side, like she has this just totally open relationship to the internet. But then on the other side, in like podcast episodes of hers or or her videos, she will talk about pretty frequently how, oh my gosh, I hate phone calls. Oh my gosh, I could never go to the post office and have to talk to the attendant there. And so... The way in which, again, that technology has given us a false sense of being able to connect, being able to talk to people. But then when it actually gets time for a spontaneous conversation out in the wild where you have to just talk to another person and be vulnerable and be present, think on your toes. It's really difficult for people because of these barriers, again, that are not only put in by institutions and lack of time energy, but by the technology, the medium itself. Um. And so solitude and solicitude were big ones that I know we we took with us kind of for throughout the rest of the cohort. Excuse me. After that in month 
three, we had a little bit more of a kind of essential sociological text as opposed to maybe one of these more like popular, easily accessible texts, but still um, not as dense as like, I, what did we do that month? Was it Baudrillard or something? Du Duopoly? I don't remember. So this was Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman. And there's a lot to cover in Manufacturing Consent. And so we really just focused on that month the kind of ingredients or propag or filters of the propaganda model that Chomsky lays out. Um, those filters being, you know, what gets filtered through and then what gets filtered out of the media, the news media, so that it's just this pristine thing that... Sorry. <laughs> um... I was looking at the, the comments, which are like way up there. I can't even see, which is probably a good thing. Keeps, keeps us not distracted over here at, at Dave's desk. Um, so, yes, filters out, you know, the, the things that are not going to benefit the elite or capital or, you know, the, the people who run the media who benefit from the messages that we can get out on the media um, to, you know, just make this pristine, you know, news media that we all as American citizens can, can just get behind and go, great, yep, wow, like actual atrocities are being funded and promoted and supported behind the scenes but because we never find out about that through the news media that's supposed to like be filling us in and keeping us informed citizens. It's, you know, manufacturing consent, consent for these horrible things that our nation does that we just are oblivious to because no one's telling us. Um, especially at this time. And so the five kind of ingredients or filters of the propaganda model that Chomsky lays out is the size, ownership, and profit orientation of the mass media. Um, let's see. Right? So just this idea that, you know, at the time, or I think now at the time it wasn't as many, but right now there's like six media giants that own all of the media and so of course there's going to be this control on what gets said what's allowed to be said um the way that ads or no that's the next one. yeah just like it is owned by a very small number of corporations so that's going to influence what knowledge and what information we get number two being advertising as the primary income source of the mass media and so if advertising is the primary income source then of course the the actual news and what gets shown on TV is going to be, you know, changed or, or funneled in such a way that will please their advertiser funders, not be too controversial. You know, maybe they're, they're su actually supporting the products that are advertising them. And so that's going to give us a very, you know, particular biased information source. Number three is the reliance of the media on information provided by government, business, and experts funded and approved by these primary sources and agents of power. So just the fact that, you know, an official source and we got it from the government when, you know, a news site is citing something doesn't necessarily mean that we can actually trust that information considering the fact that lobbying is so prevalent in the United States and if they say, oh, the government said this, well, well, what funding and what, you know, advertising and money is backing that statement? Um, right, so that's that one. Number four was flack as a means of disciplining the media. So flack being like discrediting um, a source, trashing a story, trying to divert the conversation. Just when, when something is said on a certain site that what another side doesn't agree with it's okay how can we discredit this and so there's just a constant battle of of not only like here's what my side says here's what my side says here's why this side's wrong here's why this side's wrong here's why this source is wrong why you shouldn't trust this source the sources that you know would undermine the authority that would undermine the government of course those are the ones that we're going to go no don't listen to that source that's fake news um and finally at the time that Chomsky was writing this, you know, anti-communism was the, the national religion or the control mechanism. So a lot of the, the media was being centered on anti-communism, communism is bad, 
Cold War, American patriotism, but really the anti-communism, you could just kind of fill in the blank for any sort of common enemy. And especially now, as we'll get into with the next text, you know, for, for left liberal media, it's, oh my gosh, uh, the right is the enemy. So it's anti-right rhetoric that really shapes that kind of side of the news media. And then for the right, it's, oh, the liberals, the, the socialists, whatever, the wokes. Um, and that's their kind of scapegoat in this sense. Um, and so this month was really just to kind of put a critical eye to media and our media consumption, especially now since we're, we're oversaturated with, with news, particularly like we get, you know, if you're on Instagram, people are sharing tweets and stories and, and reels and TikToks of all this information, not only like, you know, the, the things that are going on globally, but even like, oh, this ingredient is toxic for you. Actually, this ingredient is toxic for you. Actually, this food is bad for you. And like all these conflicting messages, all this information and this information gluttons, trying to parse out, be critical of, okay, where is this information coming from? Who is funding this information? You know, what, what side is this supporting? And particularly in this month, we focused on the idea that through these, these filters and this propaganda model, what emerges in the media is this idea of worthy versus unworthy victims. Uh, when thinking about, you know, tragedies and atrocities and, and war, especially right now, you know, what words get used in the media to talk about the, the victims from one side versus the victims of the other? Are they going to tell us about, you know, the children dying? In Gaza, are they going to actually give us the numbers or, or in other situations and other circumstances, you know, the selective use of the word murder versus genocide versus killed and how those words have different meanings and emphases and the ways in which that can shape the narrative around a story. And so just manufacturing consent, we, we did a very, you know, shallow look into that, but just to this time around, it was to really look at those filters and understand the ways in which media functions. In that way. The follow-up to Manufacturing Consent was Matt Taibbi's Hate, Inc., which is really just in the same way that Amusing Ourselves to Death was kind of Postman's expansion on McLuhan. Hate, Inc. is Taibbi's expansion on the Manufacturing Extent or Manufacturing Consent project. Um, this, co this came after... Trump's 2016 election, um, and Taibbi, the main points from his book that we talked about was we laid out his 10 rules of hate, hate Inc. referring to the, you know, news media system right now that is just so founded on and, and run by hate, hating the other side, attacking the other side. We focused on the 10 rules of hate that he lies out that really shapes the media. And those are the fact that there are only two ideas, left or right, conservative or Democrat. The two ideas are in permanent conflict. We should hate people, not institutions. You know, oh, it's Trump. Oh, it's Biden. Oh, it's this Republican senator. Oh, it's this Democratic senator. With no conversation on the system or the structures going on there. Um, everything is someone else's fault or particularly the other side's fault. Nothing is everyone's fault. Oh, someone always has to take the blame for whatever tragedy, law, social ill, whatever. Um, root, don't think, in the sense that, in the, like, he, he especially talks about the way in which politics in the United States have become almost like a sport. And when, especially, you know, as debate time comes around, the way in which news sites and, and media use words that we would typically use in like football or wrestling to describe what just happened in a political debate for the presidential candidates of the United States. So it's just kind of root for your side, just blindly support your side. Don't think about it at all. Um, no switching teams is another one of the rules. The other side is literally Hitler is, is a big one in the rules of hate. And in the fight against Hitler, everything is permitted. So if the other side, you know, for example, is, is oh my gosh, is, is harming children. They're so bad. We must stop them at all costs to save the children. Um, and so everything is permitted. Every 
slur or or insult you might throw out is justified because they are so bad they're basically hitler um and all of this is kind of based in the the final rule of feeling superior um our side is is the superior side is the morally correct side get on our side we will save america we will save america from the racists or we will save america from the the gays like whatever side you're on they're they're like we got it we we have it figured out be on our side it's all the other side's fault and that's really the media model that Thai ABC is, especially in a post-Trump world. And so this was another month to kind of expand on manufacturing consent, take it a step further, make it more relevant, and think critically about the ways in which we might knowingly or unknowingly participate in the, the, the rules of hate, participate in the hate cycle, um, or the hate, the hateful media, and what that does to us as individuals. Um, the last two months, we really took a shift away from kind of the news and the media. I mean, we looked specifically at our own devices and social media. And so our first book in these last two, um, was Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport, as Dave mentioned. Um, so this one was definitely more of the like self-help, um, pop, like New York Times bestseller type of book. But it gave us a really interesting assignment, which I'll talk about at the end here. Um, so Newport, you know, lays out the situation in which our, our modern technology and our smartphone use is, is particularly complicated in a complicated vice or addiction because of the ways in which it mixes the harm with the benefits, right? And so not a lot of other addictions that we can think of have so many positives in the way that technology use or Facebook or, or whatever, you know, insert new media here, the benefits that those can have, but the benefits, like by using it for its benefits, it's necessarily creating the harm. And so we're in this very particular problem. And Newport says that, you know, with such a powerful technology, with such a, you know, controlling or addictive technology, we need to take a very strong position towards it. We cannot just use hacks and tips and willpower to navigate and so that's where his digital minimalism he calls it a philosophy you know people like this they they throw out the word philosophy um as as meaning just like i don't know dave what what would you say what what word should go here instead of philosophy for the uh for for what Newport's doing? Like a like philosophy a, of philosophy of digital minimalism. Not a philosophy. Yeah, just kind of like uh life wisdom. Yeah. The life or, wisdom, or, the value, honestly. the rule, whatever of of digital minimalism. But it is his, you know, philosophy and he he defines it as a philosophy of technology use in which you focus your online time on a small number of carefully selected and optimized activities that strongly support things you value and then happily miss out on everything else, right? And so understanding our values is going to be a really important one for, for digital minimalism. Um, he explains the three principles of digital minimalism being that and, and why, you know, why it is so imperative that we, we take a, a minimalistic approach to our digital technological lives. Those three principles being that one, clutter is costly. Um, having, you know, so much going on on our phones and our media and the, the toll that that takes on us as individuals, that's the cost that we're paying for the potential benefits. And so weighing the costs over the benefits and, and what to cut out is important. He says optimization is important, right? Learning how to use these things efficiently, as little time as possible, um, spent on them. And finally, intentionality is satisfying. So, so sticking to our values, living by our values, eliminating what is useless, what is harming us, like it feels good, not in just this like moralistic sense, but like our lives are better when we live that way. And so he lays out, you know, here's the challenge for 30 days, you're going to do a complete digital detox and you're going to cut out all optional media use and then after that that's when he he comes back in and 
and you reintegrate certain fields after having had the time to reflect on your values, have a little bit more solitude, replace maybe time that you would have spent scrolling or on Facebook or watching Netflix all night. You replace it with like anything and everything that's not on a screen. Um, and so that one was a good lead into our monthly assignment of that month, which again, I'll talk about at the end here. And our final kind of popular book that we went through this time, last cohort, um, was 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jaron Lanier. Um, his book and the arguments that he makes really pairs well with philosophy. Um, and just not like philosophy in, in the broad sense of like thinking about values and ethics and what it means to be be human there was so much potential there to to have this to ha to incorporate more like actually philosophical ideas and values that kind of that rooted his 10 arguments and so that was my my biggest problem with the book um is 10 arguments for deleting your social media as i it wasn't really based in in that but it still i think was a powerful book that made some powerful arguments and so the the 10 arguments are each chapter is an argument that linear lays out is one you are losing your free will with social media two quitting social media is the most finely targeted way to resist the insanity of our times i think this one really hit home especially in thinking about okay living by our values if we're gonna take a stance and say i live this way like i i believe in this value very strongly then quitting social media and saying no i do not participate would be in his view, you know, the, the necessary way to uphold that value. And obviously with social media and the, the technological necessities of our time and just the fact that it's really hard to not have social media or even just a smartphone in this day and age for a lot of people is is difficult or the fact that, oh, well, I could have a smartphone because I need like my work app on it. For a lot of people, like nowadays, you clock into your job from your phone. And so Right, there's so many reasons to have a smartphone and then all the, the negatives that come with it, right? That like Newport talked about. Um, number three, social media is making you into an asshole. Number four, social media is undermining truth. Social media is making what you say meaningless. Social media is destroying your capacity for empathy, right? Circling back to Sherry Turkle and her solitude versus solicitude concerns social media is making you unhappy social media doesn't want you to have economic dignity especially when thinking about the bombardment of specifically curated to you advertisements that are just so enticing um you might as well just just click on it just buy the thing um social media is making politics impossible and his last one, another really powerful one, social media hates your soul. And so we talked about these, you know, 10 arguments and the nuances there and, and the fact that it's not as simple as just delete it because not everyone has the privilege to do that or it's difficult. It's just like straight up difficult to break an addiction that for a lot of people and a lot of young people has been part of their lives for probably over a decade at this point. For some, even their whole lives. I mean, you see like, three-year-olds out in public with dinner at at dinner with their families and the whole family including the three-year-old is like on a screen watching a show rather than like playing tic-tac-toe on the kids menu like you're supposed to do when you're three years old um anyways and so those are those are the books that's kind of the the recap of what you all missed but you didn't miss it because one they're there to rewatch. Two, we're just going to keep expanding on these ideas and, and coming back to these texts and probably in future cohorts and future iterations of the critical media theory research cohort, we'll come back to some of these books and go at them with a different angle or go a little bit deeper. But this was the foundation. This was this was round one. And I don't know if like if all of you have looked at the syllabus or if Dave mentioned this yet, but something that we did last time and we're going to continue doing with this critical media theory research here is so we we you know have our philosophical text dave gives a lecture um on that i come in with our our popular 
book, bring my social science perspective. We're critical of it, but we look at, you know, what's what's good from the text. So kind of like what we're doing with the critical doxology uh, and time energy sessions. And then we give you an assignment. To try for the month, usually in relation to like your own technology use. And so some of the assignments that we had last time were, for example, like month one was just buy a special notebook. That is your CMT notebook and reflect daily or almost daily on your entertainment and consumption habits, how the mediums are affecting you, how much time you spend on your screens. And I know that like Nance probably took that assignment the most seriously. Like when we were on tour with him, he was writing every day. Like he's got his little notebook right there. So Nance, A plus on that one. Um, we had a month where we were challenged to reclaim solitude and solicitude. So we had to go, you know, schedule a time for three to six hours um, just to go out like in nature or your city or wherever and just like be with your thoughts. Maybe you write, you know, reading aloud, no music aloud, just be. And then on the flip side, it was, you know, try to schedule a long phone call or a walk with an old friend and catch up and practice that solicitude being present. Um, we, with the digital minimalism book, we challenged everyone to do that, like, digital detox, so kind of an all optional media ban and see what you can replace it with. Um, and so we'll continue doing that. And that's kind of where the discussion sections are really great because one, we can reflect on um, the texts and the lectures, but then also we can come in kind of being in the middle of whatever the monthly assignment or experiment was and reflect and see what the challenges were and see what the successes were and share our tips and, and kind of it's accountability also. I think with something as as severe and serious as like social media addiction or our, you know, overuse of technology, whatever your issue might be or your problem might be with the with the media, the mediums, um, it's a good accountability to, to say, I gotta do this so I can I can show up to the, the cohort and, and have something to say and like prove that I can do it. And I think with yeah, something like this, it's it's necessary and it's helpful. So with that, that's your recap. That's what you missed on CMT. Um, and we're going to go into Dave, given the the recap. So let's, he's getting the camera all ready for the lecture. We're putting on the lecture blazer so you take him seriously. And, <laughs> and I'll, I'll hand it over. So thank you all. Give it up for Anne. Thank you, everybody, for giving her your attention um, and for uh, also being uh, fun in the chat. There's a lot of violence today, a lot of people talking about killing people. I thought that that was pretty cool. I uh, things you're not allowed to say on YouTube chat, you know, so that's awesome. Uh, I'm going to switch the camera view here. And while I do it, I'm going to say I'm not wearing a blazer so that you'll take me more seriously. I am wearing a blazer so that I will take myself more seriously. Um, it's a silly thing, but it's it, for some reason it, it, it works sometimes. I don't know. Um, can you all do you all see the whiteboard now? Is that working? All right. Let's see if I can get the. We can oh. also see like the little screen of the Zoom call in the Zoom call. So I don't know if you want that. I guess it doesn't bother me, but it might bother someone else. Oh, shit. OK, yeah, I do want that uh, uh, visible for people on the OBS side, but that's not necessary. Oh, shit. How do I change that? In OBS, Is that in the. In the gear next to virtual camera, click it yeah. and go to output type scene. Yeah, it's the, I don't think, yeah, I'm using the whiteboard scene and that's where I'm currently at. What about, no, that was not going to work. I don't want to get stuck on this. Um, whatever, uh, hold on. All right, got that fixed. And.
All right. Can you hear me? Am I coming through good? Loud and clear? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Ann. So that was a fantastic speed run. Honestly, it was, it was very detailed and went into things. Maybe on, like, it may be a little self-conscious about what I'm about to do because I'm not going to do it uh, nearly as um, thoroughly, I guess, thoroughly is the, is the word here. Um, let's see. Am I able to see the chat? I do actually want to be able to see the chat while I'm lecturing in case um, that sometimes it's important. What, what is Daniel saying is his favorite? Let's see here. Uh, also, Anne, your work on Postman's take on news was excellent. Yeah, and that's and Daniel saying that's his uh, one of his favorite things about Postman. Yeah, the information action ratio. I think about that all the time, and how you know you get a handful of people who feel very very strongly about the news that they consume and about how everybody else should watch the news that they consume. And if everybody else watched the news that they consumed and interpreted it the way that they do, then everything would be better. But because people don't consume the news that they consume and they don't interpret it the way that they interpret it, things suck, right? This is a, a huge, a huge, uh, obviously very uh, loud um, portion of the spectacle on the internet. But of course, it, it actually it makes up a, a, a minority of the, the human species, not to mention the actual people who are using the internet. Why? Well, because the sort of silent majority, and I'm, not, I'm using that in a, in a sense that is different than, say, how Ronald Reagan would use it. But there is a majority. It's not a hegemonic majority, which is the, the more conservative, oh, yeah. The silent majority agrees with us is kind of what they're saying. No, no, there's a silent majority. It doesn't agree with anybody. It's not actually totalizable in any sort of simplistic way. In fact, it's actually uh, fractured. It is not a mass. It is not a mainstream. It is not a bunch of people who agree with one another. It, in, in almost anything except for a general disillusionment and disenchantment and also what with what with right disenchantment disillusionment with what with politics with the people who think that if you consume the correct media and interpret it the right way then of course everything would be better right of course you know it's because at a certain gut level maybe they think that's all a bunch of spectacle maybe it's a bunch of consumer idiosyncratic consumer choices or lifestyle branding whatever there might be these kinds of things that go along with it but also there's time energy fragility and a and a, and a sort of sense of distrust or post trust Right. Well, this is actually part of the reason that we want to get into Baudrillard this year, because Baudrillard is a sort of son of the two main thinkers that we have set up as the fathers of this field. So Marx and McLuhan. Now, as I said in my first lecture for CMT last year, some people have a problem with this idea that Marx is even related to CMT, but it was actually Marx was one of the first people in the history of the world to say that these fundamental changes in the means of production, that is industrialization itself, was resulting in a change in human experience at the level of alienation, which I'll be lecturing about on the fourth Sunday of this month in the Critical Doxology and Time Energy Seminar that Anne had referenced. Right. Well, that's Marx thinking about how the system, the structure, the the technology, the the means of production, how that sets the parameters for the ways that culture unfolds. And we can't think about a cultural uh, uh, experience or or moment zeitgeist without reference to the material conditions that might uh, or that were in effect, right? And then, of course, McLuhan comes in with this understanding that the media, that it's not just technology. The 
technology mediates experience. And insofar as it mediates experience, it actually shapes how we perceive, how we understand, how we interpret. And therefore, as Anne had kind of said, structures us, right? Now, this is where Anne was uh, talking about, she said, I think she said like, yeah, I could be I could be nice and say that this shaped my upbringing, but really it fucked me up. Well, the critical aspect of critical media theory gets into trying to understand the ways that things are fucked up as consequences of conditions of possibility. So I'll just say right here, um be before I get back to Baudrillard, I'm going to say uh effed up. Okay, so we know that something's effed up. What is it? What's so what's so effed up? Well, the critical maneuver in this sort of continental philosophy tradition is to kind of think, what are the conditions, which is to say, I'm using the symbol here for necessary. What are the necessary conditions of possibility? That's the diamond symbol. What are the conditions of possibility for why things are fucked up? Right? It's it's one thing to be like all of these best these uh these bestseller lifestyle um guru uh common sense kinds of um Amazon bestseller people, you know, New York Times bestseller people, and to talk about how it's fucked up. You know, I think that uh I actually owe a a, a sort of debt to Cal Newport that didn't ever get um, given in my time energy, uh, book. And that is, um, I was thinking about where, when did I really start thinking about like the large blocks of time, you know, large energy infused, repeatable blocks of time. It's like, I knew that that's what it was. And that's what I was trying to get at for, you know, five years of the theory. But I think it was reading Cal Newport's deep work that kind of really drove home the point that like nothing of value ever comes out of anything that's less than six hours of dedicated focus that is able to be sustained through effort over time. Uh, Big Jim says, where does the square slash diamond conditions of possibility no notation come from? Um, so in modal logic, the, the square means necessary and the diamond means possible and then of course you could also do like uh not possible or impossible the this little uh symbol is it's not a tilde the tilde is like that which is also sometimes a negation but no this is the symbol for negation uh and i i like to use that instead of the tilde because the tilde can also mean approximately and i don't like to confuse things like that um, but then you've also got the tilde or, or the, sorry, the negation before, uh, necessary, which means contingent. So the diamond means possible. The not diamond means impossible. The, the square means necessary. The not square means unnecessary, AKA contingent. You know, I'm not an expert in modal logic. I took a class in it one time and most of it was not really getting into this stuff, but like, this is the part that really stuck with me because I started to use it in my own personal shorthand. And, uh, I've been using it in my shorthand for the better part of seven or eight years. Um, anyway, putting the diamond inside of the square, that's just my own shorthand for saying, uh, conditions of possibility. Right. And so that's a critical maneuver is to, to ask what are the conditions of possibility for the thing that is driving everybody crazy or fucking everybody up. And so uh, it's one thing to say, ah, oh, we're doing media theory. We want to understand these devices so that we can have a little bit more freedom from them. And we want to be able to, uh, to, to see what's unique in our uh, current moment compared to the rest of human history. What is it about Homo Faber, aka the, the being who uses tools, right? What is it about us? Um, in this moment that via our various technologies that expand our powers and our speed, um, and the, the media that mediate our sensory apparatus, 
uh, makes it so that things are different now, or things are intensified now, or certain things that were sort of mainstays of human civilization or culture are now impossible or, or very difficult to either achieve or, uh, or if you think that you're achieving something that humans have always been able to do, it's actually a sad, sad simulation of that thing, which is what brings us back to Baudrillard, the son of McLuhan and Marx. And now I am in no way um, a Baudrillard expert. I think we can wrangle from Michael Downs an actual lecture on Baudrillard versus Debord. Right? It's one thing to say that this is all a simulacrum, which points to Baudrillard. It's another thing to say that it's all spectacle, which points to Debord. And then for me, for the last many, many years, I've been like, well, what's the difference between these two things? Um, kind of seems like they're used interchangeably. But it is the theoretical standpoint that uh, Baudrillard is coming at things uh, from and certain operating assumptions that he has um, in action and, or, or, or that are operative. So we'll just say Baudrillard uh, versus Debord. Now, this is not recap in a sort of sense. This is kind of like a where we're going. I'll get into some recap stuff, but like I told you, I'm not going to be as thorough as Anne. I am giving ourselves a lot more wiggle room this year than last year. I think that in some cases, we will be revisiting certain texts from last year. In some cases, we'll be revisiting certain topics, like Hunter Rents stuff on morality and solitude and solicitude. We have to come back to it. I'll say some stuff about that in a minute. Uh, but this flexibility going into this new year is because I am doing that with critical doxology and time energy, and I realized I really like that approach. So what is it in that approach? Well, it's, it's giving myself license to just stick to the basics, which then means that I can transgress that and go hard and do something crazy, like a, a, like, a, like a crash course on being in time. I wouldn't have actually done the crash course on being in time without that flexibility, because otherwise I would have worked myself up into knots over it, and then I would have never got around to it. And it's okay because you're not expected to do the readings ahead of time. You're, you're, we're, we're kind of telling you about the readings and then you can do them on your own afterwards and tie that into your own research, into your own uh, proposals, into your own presentations, et cetera, right? And so Baudrillard versus Debord is something that I want to wrangle from Michael Downs because he's been studying Baudrillard longer, I think, than any of us, pretty much anyone on the internet, and he's been doing it in the way that I hope at this point you're all familiar with, but if you're not, then there is this idea that, um, well, he, he doesn't trust his interpretation of a thinker unless he's able to explain it to a person who didn't do the reading, much less a person who has no experience in theory whatsoever. It's sort of the bar stool, the guy on the bar stool next to you, if you can't explain it to that person in simple terms. And can you really explain it? And then, of course, you could say, well, then that lends itself to the, the danger of oversimplification. And I would say, well, of course. But that's why he does, uh, you know, 100-page blog posts, you know, trying to flesh out every nuance, right? Because that's the thing. is like you can either write theory in a super condensed fashion, and you can cover a lot of ground that way. Or you could kind of, in, in this less condensed fashion, work through it at that level where you're able to explain it to a person who's got no background in it. You're not, you're not assuming what they know. Well, at that level, though, it's going to take a lot longer to say the damn thing, right? So, spectacle on the one side, on the DeBoard side, and simulacrum on the other side. What is the real difference? And Mikey told me that the real difference comes down to, for Baudrillard, he is thinking, no, sorry, for Debord, he is thinking about passivity. 
people are pacified. Pacified by the spectacle. They were watching a whole generation of people uh, who thought they were woke, you know, with a new left, you know, anti-Vietnam, etc., civil rights, uh, you know, become super pacified. And it wasn't just, you know, that the, the activists were pacified. No, actually, the activists were like the activists of today. 100% certain that if you just watched the right thing and had the right interpretation, the world would change. You just have to listen to them. Listen. You know, well, that wasn't working. And so Debord and his, uh, his homies in France, uh, they had like this theory of the spectacle and how it was pacifying people, which is also kind of similar to Postman, right? And amusing ourselves to death. It also gets into this idea of passivity. Okay, well, then what's, what is it Baudrillard is doing that's so different? And this is where I think we have a genuine contribution. And a real uh, shift. And, and I think Zizek, there's some similarities between Zizek and Baudrillard on this. Um, this is going to be why Mikey doesn't want to get into it because he kind of hinted at that in the first live stream he ever did with me. And then ever since then, he's kind of regretted it and he doesn't want to talk too much about it because he's writing a book about Zizek and Baudrillard uh, and uh, consumer culture. And so a lot of the things that he's going to say uh, or he doesn't want them to get out there before the book gets out there. But I think that he could do a basic lecture on this distinction. And the distinction is between, on the one side, passivity, and on the other, pseudo-activity. Which is to say, when you are doing a lot of stuff, but it's actually amounting to nothing. It's not actually doing what you think that it's doing. And in case, and, and, and it actually, it might even be having the opposite effect, right? Might even be having the opposite effect. And part of the issue that Baudrillard is keen on here is that we do not live in this mass age that McLuhan thought we were moving into, the mass age of the global village, right? Because that's what McLuhan was looking around. He was like, ah, look at these, these student activists. They're also woke today. They understand that war fucking sucks because they're actually seeing it on their televisions. And so it's catalyzing them to action. Yeah, but also while a handful of people are catalyzed to action, you have all these other people that are pacified. And that's what DeBoard is talking about. Yep. Nope. On the other side, though, there is pseudo-activity. And instead of the mass age, so I'll just go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and uh, remove some of the stuff on this whiteboard. Um, I'm going to re re remove the board, pacified, um, and I'm going to go ahead and put under McLuhan, mass age, which he started saying the medium is the massage, right? So you can say the medium is the massage, which was like, there is basically a, a like some, somewhere along the line, uh, McLuhan was talking about the mass age. <clears throat> the medium is the mass age. And this uh, massage this massage thing became this play on it. But for Baudrillard, he starts going like, yeah, it is a mass. It is a mass. But it's not the kind of mass that you're thinking, McLuhan. It's not the kind of mass that you're thinking. It is the fractured mass. And of course, there was a time of television, mass television and radio, where there was this idea of, you know, a uh, silent majority and uh, mainstream, right? And McLuhan was the the media theory, the father of media th theory at the at the dawn of this idea of the 
of the public, not the newspaper public, but the radio television public, very different public. And so he's trying to theorize that public and, and, you know, he's very optimistic. You know, he's got his pessimistic moments, but he's also pretty optimistic that, like Ann said, education can help change the game for us. But what we see now is that Baudrillard was right, is that people are more fractured than they've ever been. I was actually shocked. You know, it's just a kind of a funny or fun example of this. I was like literally shocked uh, in my discussion section at the university, one of my discussion sections at the university, when almost all of my students in the discussion section, like 20 students, almost all of them had seen Saltburn, this new movie. Uh, like two students there had not seen it. Everyone else had seen it. So uh, really quick, who's here? Show... For the people with their cameras on, you're the only ones who are showing right now. Uh, hands up if you have seen Saltburn. One, two, three, four, five. Is that like five? Is that right? David Powers is a no. Theo is a no. Why do I ask this? Well, there used to be this funny thing called the Western Canon, and uh, people built their identities around how they disagreed on various aspects of it, like uh, uh, which is to say what's included in it. People didn't like the inclusion of this or that author, um, or they didn't like this or that mainstream interpretation of this or that text, and instead they would have their own uh, take on it. Always vis-a-vis, -vis, which is to say in reference to the sort of mainstream uh, canonical approach to the uh, Western literature, right? Well, th that meant that people didn't just have maybe this like, oh yeah, a lot of us have seen this one movie. A lot of us have seen this one show. Oh, nobody sees the, the music. No, no one's heard the music I listen to. No one's seen the shows that I watch, right? Like, the, no, no. Everybody, insofar as they got an education, had read their Aristotle, had read their Plato, had read their Aristophanes, had read their Homer, had read their Bible, had read their uh, Thomas Jefferson, their John Stuart Mill, their, right? At some point, maybe even Marx, right? I have the great books downstairs. Uh, I inherited them when the philosophy department was moving and they were giving away the entire great books collection. They were like, do you want these? And I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. Because I was like a TA at the time. And so anyway, I have all the great books. And the, uh, yeah, Marx is in there. Marx is included. Um, the canon was sort of like the background conditions of intelligibility for Marshall McLuhan to be anti-canon. It was the conditions of possibility for him to also assume that the global village was going to come from the age of television and radio. It's because he had grown up in a society where everybody had this canonical basis for their intelligibility. Everybody's identities could be vis-a-vis -vis in reference to that canon. We are post-canon now. Not only are we post-canon, we're post people having the same shows, right? I, that's good for me and it's bad for you. It's bad for anybody who kind of comes from, let's just say like if you're a 90s kid, you come out of the public schooling system, you're in a very different world now from all of these internet people, right? Because you, everyone had seen the Ninja Turtles, everyone had seen the Power Rangers, everybody was at least like in on the basics of Pokemon. Um, there was, you know, Star Wars, like there's just all these, uh, especially 1980s cultural products that were kind of just like also taken for granted for the 90s kid. And I say that that's a disadvantage for you if you're coming from that background, but it's an advantage for me. Why is it an advantage for me? Well, it's because I don't come from the 90s. I come from uh, like a peasant 
a, a like a peasant like outback like 300 miles from the nearest castle in the medieval era like like i i am like like my my upbringing was not in this world right it was it was completely removed except that every once in a while i'd, I'd catch a peek into the society and i'd be like oh star wars is a thing but i didn't know what like i knew the name i knew the brand but i didn't know the content right because i was very sheltered uh, in a sort of religious upbringing, very homeschool, blah, blah, blah. And so for me, it's like when I ran away from home and I started, uh, I really just started with my blockbuster slash Hollywood video membership over the years. And I would watch like, you know, two to three movies a day. I was just constantly grinding to try to, I always felt like this need to catch up, right? I'd also go to like Borders Books or Hastings or what are these places where you can listen parts of, of, of albums. Right. And I would just sit there and I would just like, I would spend all the time that I wasn't working or partying at these places, listening to, to the culture, trying to get a sense for what was going on there. And it was the same with like movies and shows, always doing catch up work, always doing catch up work. And so now when people are like, like the, the, they'll reference something and I'm like, yeah, no, I haven't seen that. And they do this whole like thing. They go, Oh, <sighs> What? You haven't done that? What? Why? Why not? Whoa. You know, like uh, I watched The Goonies at some point in my adulthood, but when I was uh, growing up, and kids would reference the uh, The Goonies, hey, you guys, I was always just like, you know, and people love this movie. They love this movie. Like it was a whole generation of '90s kids love this movie, and I was like, I didn't get it. But by the time I watched it as an adult, I didn't have the nostalgia that adults who did watch it as kids have going back. So now I watch it and I go, yeah, I, I get why you would have liked that as a kid. But I lack like that personal nostalgia that could have made it mean something. I don't, why am I going into all this detail? I'm just trying to say as a cultural outsider, the age of the internet, which is the fractured mass that Baudrillard was talking about in the first place, is like an advantage for it's an advantage for me because uh people who come from my generation who still kind of assume everybody shares all these reference points are ignorant they don't understand that they live in the fractured mass age right um and me i am a child of the fractured mass age in a sort of sense so i get it and so when I was reading Baudrillard with uh, Nance over tour, and we were reading this one book, uh, who is it by? Gnosko? Is that what it was? Um, it's called- Yeah, Gary, Gary Gnosko, uh, Baudrillard and McLuhan. Yeah. I can't remember the subtitle. Now, I think that that one might be actually on the channel where we're reading it together. I don't know if we read the whole book onto the channel. I think it's only a few chapters that we read. But it was that chapter where we get into the the this this play off of the mass age and where where Baudrillard starts really theorizing the fact that it's fractured that I got excited. Now, of course, it's because of my own background and understanding that yeah, I get it. Everywhere I go, you should never assume anybody has the same reference points that you do. Right. Like there's a like I think that people do this little apologetic dance if they explain something where they're like, I know you all know this, but here, let me explain it just in case there's somebody who doesn't know it. You'll notice I never do that shit because I'm like, no, nobody knows this. And, and if I end up explaining even Harry Potter, if I have to explain the story of Harry Potter, then it's funny and it's fun for the people who already know about it. But it's like. Bitch, you should not fucking assume that people know about that. Okay, now Harry Potter, maybe at a certain point, like it's enough people's background that you kind of can still assume it. But I just kind of don't assume when it comes to our shared reference points. Mikey's like the extreme opposite. You know, he every cultural product from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, he knows it. Like every single one, whether it was like a, a popular movie or if it was like, super like underground shitty B movie, or if it was like, uh, you know, criterion collection, whatever he knows about it all. 
you know, he, he as it's like having like a good allowance because your mom's doing okay at that time in the, at during the booming eighties, uh, having a, a decent allowance and being able to have movie nights with your friends every night and having like the unlimited membership with blockbuster. Yeah. I would have also been like this filmophile kind of guy that he is. I just wasn't right. We just didn't watch movies, uh, except for like, I don't know, a handful, you know, a handful. All right. So with all of that said, Marx versus McLuhan is what we started out on and talking about how we got media theory on the one side and critical theory on the other side, bringing the two together. What does that look like? Well, I have to say a thing about theory that I started saying um, when I wrote the piece for underground theory. And that is that, and I'm going to wave that book here at the camera so you can see it. In underground theory, I talk about how there's two kinds of theory, roughly speaking. Issuing from Marx, there are two kinds of theory. Now, Marx had said we must change the world. Philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. And I've loved Marx, but I've also been like, Marx was wrong about things. Not only was Marx wrong about things, he lived in a different century, like two centuries ago. So it's kind of like the situation has changed, has been kind of my assumption. Even though I have like owe this tremendous debt to Marx, the situation has changed, which is why I really latched on to Zizek the first time I saw him on Big Think when he was saying that we have to invert Feuerbach's 11th thesis, which is to say, um, if you know, if for, if for Marx, it was that hitherto philosophers have only interpreted the world, the point is to change it. For us, in the 20th century, people tried to change it too fast, and now we need to rethink it. Rethink it. And of course, the dogmatic, ideological, literalist uh, even kind of approach to politics, which you also see with Bible thumpers, um, is that, the, is that the, p the page speaks for itself. You can just read it. It tells you the truth as long as your heart is in the right place. As long as you're one of the good ones, you can just be yourself and read it and you'll know the truth. And that is dogmatic, ideological, evangelical, fundamentalist, literalist bullshit. Uh, yeah, we all know that uh, is bullshit when it comes to the Bible, but then we forget that that's also the case when it comes to a book like Das Kapital or trying to read the critique of the Gotha program or whatever. Now, for half of you who have no background in Marx, don't even worry about these references. We'll get into them eventually. That's not very important right now. The point is, is that in the world of politics, people think they don't have to interpret. They already know what the problem is. They already know what the situation is. Now, we just have to push towards the solution. If only enough people watch the right news and interpret it the right way, then everything would be okay, right? We would get the revolution that we want. The revolutionary subject would emerge, whether it's the working class or something else, the precariat, who knows, could be the third world, whatever. It'll emerge as long as we can just get this right, right? Of course, what is presupposed is an understanding of the situation and what the solution needs to be. And most of the time, what is presupposed is some fusion of old left and new left from the 1960s. It's kind of stupid to call it the new left. It's the old new left, we'll call it that. The old left and the old new left, it's some kind of fusion of its assumptions, uh, which is to say from two previous centuries, uh, the assumptions from two previous centuries of, of, of wannabe social change makers are getting copied and pasted into our current context under our current solution. And therefore we're supposed to know what the uh, the, the Here's, here's what we're supposed to do. This is what must be done. And the two kinds of theory that issue from Marx are, uh, on the one side, this is what must be done. And on the other side, hey, y'all, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? Let's figure that out. Right? And so I've been obviously a lot more into the, hey, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? approach to critical theory uh, because of my time spent organizing in the United States where you're pretty much surrounded by uh, slightly more radical than Democrat types of progressives 
on the one side, and maybe they're into class or not, it doesn't matter. And then on the other side, Marxists is basically the, div the division there. And of course, maybe they're not Marxists by anything but name, uh, and, and they'd call themselves socialists or communists or anarchists or uh, anarcho-communists or something like that. But that is kind of like the, ever since like Occupy, ever since like, what was that, 2008? I don't know. For a long time now, uh, there has been like this fusion of these different perspectives. And then there's a handful of people who are really committed to one of these traditions from one of these previous centuries and keeping that interpretation alive. Um, and then people who kind of just like, oh, we mix it up. We, 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 we synthesize these things. We fuse them together. And I was a fusionist for a long time. Uh, and I, I, I would say that I was a, you know, I, a very, very, very naive fusionist. And then I got to be a bit more of a sophisticated fusionist over time. Uh, and, but then because of my actual organizing experience with people who treat the words of Karl Marx, like it's the Bible and think that it speaks on its own. As long as your heart is in the right place, I got really disillusioned with, with, uh, worldview Marxism, especially now I was already disillusioned with Marxism. I don't think I ever took that occupy shit about how we all need, we can't have hierarchies. We can't have leaders. We can't have, uh, you know, organs, uh, for, uh that, that where people meet and then make decisions before they go out in the public. Like I was, I was, I always thought that was kind of foolish. Um, a lot of people who spent the better part of a decade, uh, doing this sort of folk political, let's all sit in a circle and jerk off and talk about our pronouns. Like eventually they get burnt out and they really do want things to change outside of their little circle. And then once they really burn out, they'll leave this little radical left kind of position and they'll get into like a more structural approach, or at least they'll say the word structure and systemic a lot. The question is, is like, do they know what that means? And then, you know, insofar as they get into Marx, they might actually start to develop an understanding of what that means. I have no doubt that they might actually get some kind of a sense for what that means. But they get a sense for what that means from 200 years ago, not for our moment today. And so this has been a journey for me. And the need to make this distinction between what must be done and, oh, that didn't work in the world of theory was not just from my practical experience. It also comes from the realization um, that in the world of theory, this is rarely really articulated. The why it matters is rarely articulated in a way that would make sense to an outsider. So why does this fractured mass matter as a sort of expansion pack on the sort of what must be done approach to Marx. Now for Marx, half his theory, the critique of political economy is a response to, uh, David Ricardo. Is it David? I think it's David Ricardo, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, um, the, the Kropotkin, Proudhon, uh, you know, the, the, the anarchists, uh, the Rousseau, uh, but also the German idealists, uh, basically from Kant through Hegel and and kind of bringing all of these different kind of approaches together in one grand imminent critique of the system, trying to understand the system. But why is he doing that? It's because he's convinced that the ideas people are operating under about what must be done are wrong. It's because he's convinced that communism is wrong. People tend to think of him as a communist instead of the greatest critic of communism. But in the same way that the author of the Libertarian Manifesto, Rothbard, hated libertarianism. Karl Marx hated communism. Now, he loved working class people, and he loved people who were trying to organize the working class. And he saw hope in the communist movement, and that's why he said it can be elevated. It can do better. It can get better strategies. It's what must be done, can be corrected. But first, we have to do this imminent critique of the current situation. And the current situation was best described by the German idealists, the French socialists, and the British political economists. Of course, Adam Smith was Scottish. Shout out to Scottish motherfuckers. Uh, didn't want to just kind of act like they're all Brits. No, Adam Smith was Scottish. So, and I think David Hume was as well. I think he was as well. 
Anyway, uh, so this this whole approach, uh, where he eventually gets to the point where he says, you know what, philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. He's arguing against scholastic people who think all you have to do is interpret it, and he's coming out the other side of a research program that had gone on for decades where he was doing everything he could to understand the actual situation of the moment. And now he had some ideas as far as ways that we could move forward and actually change things. So it's not like he didn't do the interpretive work, right? Well, my, my sort insofar as I'm Marxian at all, it's like, I just believe that we have to try to understand why people's solutions aren't working and come up with something better. And I guess the way that I'm sort of post-Marxist and also post-left and also post uh, all options that are on the table, right? Now, I'm saying this in a sort of methodological sense, not in an identitarian sense. I don't identify as post-Marxist. I don't identify as post-left. But insofar as I am methodologically post all of these things, I have methodologically suspended the operating assumptions of all of these different traditions and all of these different approaches so that I can work through things. And one of the big assumptions that I have uh, suspended, I'm not operating under it, is that we are the vehicle for the change that must be done. It's not on us. That's my operating assumption. Is It's not on us. It's actually on us to lay the groundwork for the people who are going to do it. And I think that Part of that is a response to this fractured mass age. Part of that is a response to the individualism and the culture of narcissism that have come with the last hundred years of historical development, which is to say intergenerational belonging has been almost completely eradicated. People think that the young are going to be the solution. I don't buy into this at all. I don't buy into this at all. And left. Oh, shit. What does she say? Did she say something? Uh, are we so over time that Anne had to go? Hold on one sec. One sec, guys. All right, I paused the recording for a second so that I could get Nance the... Uh, co-host privileges so that he can bring Anne back in because her laptop died. So no worries, everybody. Everything is fine. And I'm not so over time. I was like worried. I was like, what if it's 1.30? No, it's only noon where I'm at. So I've got a bit more time to tie this all together. Okay. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about theory and critical theory and how it breaks up into what must be done and why did that not work? And the reason I was doing that was I was saying that this fractured mass thing makes sense to me at a gut level because I am a sort of child of the fractured mass already. But also, because of my time spent organizing and realizing everybody thinks that everybody else knows what they're talking about, but nobody actually does. People are exchanging black boxes. They're using words like freedom. They're using words like socialism or they're using words like the right or conservatism or whatever. And they're assuming everybody knows what they're talking about, but they don't, which is at this point uh, why I tend to use the American colloquial vernacular and its connotations when I use words unless I'm going to get super technical, which is why I get in trouble if I say, you know, something like right or left or conservative or progress it, it, and, and use them like they're all the same thing, right? Because like to anybody who strongly identifies with the left, they don't mean conservative or, or sorry, they don't mean progressive, right? They don't mean, um, they don't mean what Americans tend to think when they, when, when Americans use such words, but it's my frustrations with this fractured mass phenomenon and how people don't realize that we're all using words differently. Um, had me, oh, go, oh, yeah, I see where Baudrillard's coming from here. I really like this. Yes, but it's not just that. It's also that insofar as I care about critical theory, insofar as I care about the, oh, the what must be done from a different century isn't actually working, and that's not actually the solution. Um, so now, why didn't that work? And 
or how is it wrong? Or if it wasn't wrong at the time, how is it wrong now? Or does it need to be changed? Or is there some more important uh, issue at, at the moment? Like all of those kinds of questions that are coming from the side of critical theory that's saying, that ain't, that ain't it, man. Baudrillard and the theory of the fractured mass becomes such an important intervention, right? Because I'm coming at theory thinking about it this way, Baudrillard was always just to me like, oh, he poo-poos everything. He's just kind of like this cynic. He's like, you know, like Adorno, like these guys, like, come on, what's the point? They're always just so, so, uh, so pessimistic. No, but like once you actually realize, oh, it's not pessimism to say that thing is not working. Right. If if a if a person's car is broke down on the side of the road, and you pull over to help them, and you walk up, and you go, "What's wrong with your car?" and they go, "There's nothing wrong with the car. Why are you so pessimistic?" You might just get back in your car and drive away. You know, at that point, good luck. Uh, don't worry. Good luck. You also might want to call someone like, "Hey, uh, this person." That they're not all there and they're probably going to get very thirsty after a while. So they might need some help, but they don't want my help, right? Like the person who thinks that their car is fine when it's obviously not, I mean, yeah, they will think that you're a pessimist for not believing in their car. And that's how I feel about most people's vehicle for change. I'm not a pessimist. I'm wildly optimistic. And the reason I get to be so optimistic is because I don't hold to the presuppositions that they are dogmatically committed to, which means that there's all these new possibilities. Okay. So bringing critical theory and media theory together is the goal of critical media theory. And Baudrillard is only one of the many thinkers who's going to help us do that. Uh, Virilio is another one that we're very excited to get into this year. If we have the time, if we have the motivation, if we have the energy, that we could potentially get into Elul, we could potentially get into Lumen, we could potentially get into a lot of things, but also I'm not making big time promises of what we're getting into because part of it is like when it comes to someone like Stiegler or Elul or... Uh, uh, with L-Man, Lumen. I, I'm not going to give you an introductory lecture when I barely know them myself unless I feel some tremendous energy to do so and I spend so much time grinding on it that I'm like, oh yeah, I got this, guys, right? And so what we have is a plan B for this year, a plan B for this whole year. But in my ideal mind, I have a plan A. I'm just not going to tell you too much about the plan A, and I'm going to focus on the plan B. But just know that there are some lectures that are going to fucking blow your mind. Uh, I just can't make any big time promises of what months they will be on or if they're even going to be this year. So I'm going to do a quick little speed run here of what's to come. Um, right after I basically say, look, outside of everything that I just talked about, which was all in part, sorry, let me fix my microphone here, which was all in part, um, a recap from before. Um, there's also like the question of the state. Marx was not super critical of the state. He wanted it to wither away, but he didn't necessarily, uh, theorize it. Um, and the state has as much a role in technological development and the mediums that shape our lives or fuck us up as does capitalist science, right? And so the role of capitalist science on the one side and the role of the state on the other side are two things we didn't get into last year. So surveillance valley, surveillance valley, which is where Silicon Valley meets the deep state, that book by Yasha Levine, an absolute essential primer on both cybernetics as well as um, why this media is addicting in the ways that it's addicting at a more structural level. 
But we haven't even gotten into that. Same with capitalist, uh, sorry, uh, platform capitalism by Nick Cernicek, who's one of the co-authors of Inventing the Future. He wrote that with Alex Williams. Well, uh, platform capitalism and surveillance valley are going to be essential texts for this coming year, as will uh, Seeing Like a State by, uh, what's his name? James Scott, I think. James Scott, absolutely amazing. Um, people go, oh, he's a sock dam, or oh, he's an anarchist, or oh, he's a this, or oh, he's a that. He's a methodological anarchist in a very specific sense, which means that his focus as an academic is on the state. It doesn't mean that he thinks that we need to be anti-state. That doesn't mean that he thinks that we have like some kind of a post-state solution. A Daniel Garner in the chat just said that seeing like a state is absolute gold. That makes me so happy to know that you've actually read that. That's amazing. Rudy's here. <gasps> Dude, Rudy's popped in for a second. Good to see you, man. I'm stoked for you to catch up on this. Uh, it'll get posted in a couple of days. You'll be able to see it. Great to see you. Thanks for stopping by. Rudy's been a regular at CDT and CMT seminars. Anyway, so I'm just saying that last year I had touched on how we would get into the role of the state and the way that it works with business to achieve certain interests that are its own as opposed to the interests of business. But then it also has shared interests. And one of the things is when church, state, and capital share the same interests, nothing stops them. Nothing can stop it. Like it, if, you're, if you're looking at the future and thinking, how is this going to develop? And then you go, ah, this would serve church, state, and capital then you know it's going to happen. If, if, if there's a trajectory that it could take where it's going to serve one but not another, okay, well, now it might get complicated. The state is not some hegemonic thing, right? And it's largely governed by people, whether they're elected or not, who are um, human beings. And human beings have uh, commitments to values and uh, associations with other human beings on the basis of things like religion and business interests. And so it gets a lot more complicated if there's conflicting interests between these major institutions of power, which are themselves fractured in this fractured age. So the fact that there are so many fractured interests within each of those institutions and between all of those institutions means that uh, it's very hard to make predictions about the future. Unless it's just across the board beneficial for all three, regardless of how fractured they are internally or between one another. Okay. We'll be expanding on that throughout the year. And last year we really did, yeah, Anne did a great job of already touching on so much of this, but we, we brought in Edward Bernays and how advertising and propaganda are like these, it's like the same thing. Like the father of advertising and, uh, What's the word for it's a public, uh, public relations. Yes. Um, the father of public relations wrote the book on propaganda and that's not an accident, right? Nowadays, I, I, I in the university environment, referring to advertising, advertising as a form of propaganda, it gets eyebrows raised at you to say the least. But Edward Bernays is the basis upon which you can say that confidently. And if they raise their eyebrows, you can just go, yeah. Uh huh. It's true. Deal with it. Um, solitude and solicitude with Sherry Turkle and how we developed the idea of solitude through a rent. And we don't mean isolation. We don't mean loneliness, which is a definite way of using that word. It's a, it's a legitimate way of using that word. But we mean the fullness of being with oneself, the fullness of being, not just being content with oneself, oh, I'm happily by myself because I'm a fucking narcissist. No, but actually the division between me and myself. The narcissist, narcissist is in a self-referential relationship. We talked about self-referentiality through Byung-Chul Han. Self-referentiality, this is the mirror. 
self-referentiality to the self, which is like the ego. But so, and this 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 is um, isolation, which could uh, it could be boring, it could be uh, it could be anxious, um, it could be uh, it could be a variety of things, but it could also be uh, fulfilled. Now, if you're fulfilled with yourself, then of course that's going to be this sort of narcissist thing. Right. Usually like, I don't need anybody else. I don't, I, I could happily spend the rest of my time for eternity in my basement, just enjoying my consumer things. And in fact, I would prefer that. Fuck everyone else. I'm an introvert. That's just who I am. No, that's not introversion. That's not introversion. It, it might not even be clinical narcissism, right? It might not be clinical narcissism, but it is narcissism in this sense that people mean it when they say that word today which is the American vernacular. All right. Now, this is one thing. But this division between me, which is the ego, me and myself, now that's another thing. And that's what a rent is getting at. And it is a dialogue. And it's not an easy conversation. It's like psychoanalysis, except your higher self is holding your feet to the fire. And your analyst in psychoanalysis is instead like they're 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 letting you go on and on and they're trying to get to like what's really going on here, right? Well, in the conversation between me and myself that you can develop through journaling and reading lots of biographies and uh you know, really wrestling with your own demons. This, this question is the basis and origin for Arendt of morality itself. Morality as opposed to ethics. Not ethics. Ethics is how do we live with one another and what do we owe one another. Morality, on the other hand, is how do I live with myself if I keep going along with this? That could be how do I live with myself if I keep going along with my drive, being a subject to drive, doing things that I regret? But it could also be how do I live with myself when I'm going along with a sick, sad, twisted society that is having me compromise myself at every turn? The ego that is this pure consumer happily living in its basement nonetheless has to go to work. And it's easy to, when you are a producer consumer forget that you have higher aspirations higher aspirations that you feel called to i'm going to say called here and the basis of that calling is probably some kind of values and some kind of talents and that those talents and those values tell you that you have something greater to contribute to the world but of course, because you are this narcissistic, isolated, um, either anxious, boring, or fulfilled in this bullshit sense, uh, consumer who doesn't have time energy. That's why this isn't moralizing. I'm saying, I know you structurally do not have the conditions for getting that separation from yourself because that requires time energy. So the condition of possibility for this more well-rounded and difficult kind of tarrying with one's own negativity, the condition of possibility for that is time energy. And obviously a willingness to sit through difficult conversations with yourself and ask, what is it that makes life worth living? Am I compromising myself? Am I ultimately, because I have... Uh, sort of compromise myself so much thinking that there's this is this life is not worth living anymore now of course we don't usually get to that point and if we do then we get all depressed oh what's the point of this life yeah well that's because this fulfilled narcissistic uh consumer producer ego is not going to be able to live in that delusion forever and is eventually going to realize this is bullshit 
this is worthless. This is not doing it for me. And then it becomes very, very depressed. And then maybe it runs away from that depression and goes to the bar and gets laid or does a bunch of cocaine or whatever it needs to do to distract itself from the fact that this is ultimately unfulfilling. And so then it, its drive takes it into these various limit experiences. And then once those burn out, then it returns to this sick, sad equilibrium that worships the pleasure principle and doesn't ever take on genuine challenges. Okay. Now, the genuine challenges of what do I owe myself, my higher self, my higher aspirations, my calling? How do I explore my values, my talents? Um, or to others, what do I owe other people? And what, it, what am I able to contribute to other people? The condition of possibility for that is time energy and a willingness to tarry with the negative. And of course, we don't have time energy. So even if we have the willingness, then we're fucked. Well, that's what Critical Doxology and Time Energy Seminar is about. Ultimately, is finding ways to nonetheless persevere and hack the thing, hack the system to be able to achieve some modicum of the good life. Because it's going to it's not going to be in our lifetime that capital free you know uh stops reducing us to labor power and makes it so that everybody has their large energy infused repeatable blocks of time throughout the week so that they can build community so that they can do cooperative enterprises with other people so that they can take on autonomous projects to really figure out what their talents and their values are so that they can figure out like what their unique contributions are going to be for oneself and others. No, this is going to be a century of struggle, if not more, before such a thing is possible. And so in the meantime, we have to fucking figure out a way, a good enough way to be able to keep our head just above water because we're drowning right now, right? Most of us are waterlogged zombies who have been told that they are privileged and free. You're privileged. You're free. You're privileged. You're free. You're privileged. You're so fucking free. You should feel bad about how privileged and free you are because not everybody else is. And in fact, you're a waterlogged corpse living up here. And one of the ways that you can edge your way into some other zone is by beating yourself up for realizing, oh, I'm so privileged while I look in the mirror all day. Well, we don't get to have this. So in a sort of sense, yeah, of course, in a sort of sense, we're privileged. But in another sense, we're fucking not. We've been sold a lie. And there is this kind of freedom that we don't have. It's the kind of freedom that people for thousands of years knew objectively, I either have it or I don't. And that's because they were either aristocrats or they were slaves. Or some shade in between that had to preoccupy itself with necessity but the people who don't have to preoccupy themselves with necessity, who get to focus on the liberating arts, they know they're free. And that's why they're able to focus on the liberating arts, which require the sustained effort you cannot, you cannot do without large energy infused repeatable blocks of time throughout your week, every week for your whole life. So that's how time energy theory and what we're doing over at CDT, which happens on the fourth Sunday of every month ties into what we're doing here in CMT. And this was, I believe, the second lecture. We got into this distinction between me and myself in the second lecture of CMT last year. And that's where we bring in Sherry Turkle with her virtuous circle between solitude and solicitude, where she's saying, you know, there's genuine being with oneself, this kind of conversation between me and myself, asking that question of what makes life actually worth living, <clears throat> versus... um genuine being with others. And obviously where she comes at things in her book, Reclaiming Conversation, which you should get on Audible and listen to it at a bare minimum. I don't know that it requires a deep study, but you should at least listen to it three times in the next couple of years. Uh, in Reclaiming Conversation, this virtuous circle between solitude and solicitude is broken by a constant reliance on satisfying our urge to be with oneself or to be with others genuinely by turning to the cell phone and getting some kind of a sick, sad simulacrum or spectacle of it. Now, the spectacle of it leaves you pacified and the simulacrum of it gets you super engaged with it so you feel like you're not actually this isolated 
miserable fuck. Now, of course, you are this isolated, miserable fuck. We all are. And the question is, is are there ways of getting some kind of critical distance from that, some kind of freedom from that? Now, in the other weeks, we talked about duopoly and hate ink and in framing the other and in framing the face of the other and all of these different things. But I wanted to kind of focus on this aspect, which is the moral aspect. And I use the word moral in this case in a very different way than how Marx and Nietzsche are critiquing morality and moralizing. This is just like moral in the sense of like, it's not about goodness and badness in society and whether other people are going to see you as good or bad or how you are or not responsible to other people, which is ethics. No. And, and they kind of conflate those two things. No, we're talking about what makes life worth living when you realize I have to live with myself. Nobody else at the end of the day has to live with me. Everyone else can get away from me. I'm the one at the end of the day holding the bag of never being able to get out from under myself, never being able to get away from myself unless I'm drinking and smoking and coking and you know running off and doing all of the things, chasing pussy, whatever it is that you're doing. The point, this is why people feel so anxious when they sit in a room by themselves, which is, remember, if you, you might remember this famous quote by Pascal, but like a lot of the problems in the world would go away if people could just learn to sit with themselves. But why can't people learn to sit with themselves? This dynamic of running from your own most possibilities and how finite and fragile your own most possibilities really are that leads to and catalyzing falling in a Heideggerian sense. This is what's in the room with you. And it's because you have a higher self that you've betrayed. It's because you have a higher self that you have not honored. It's because it is only a human being who has this difficult relationship between me and myself that is able to have a dignified personhood. And if you have not developed that relationship, it's not your fault entirely. Your entire education system was supposed to prepare you and cultivate you for this relationship for your entire life. And it fucking didn't. Part of the preparation for this is reading people's biographies and autobiographies, people who inspire us, people who are complex, people who are not just good or bad, but people who are remarkable figures and have been sources for inspiration for as ever since they died, really, who became more important after they died than during their lifetimes. We don't read them in school. We don't get to see the struggles that other human beings went through. And if we do, then we're getting it third hand, fourth hand, not even second hand, which would be the actual biography. First hand would be the autobiography. And of course, that's still mediated and it's still a lie in a certain sense, but the voice comes through. When you read a human being in their actual voice, their humanity comes through. And the schooling system has eradicated that. The schooling system has made it so people do not get to encounter the face of the other via the voice, which is only possible in the written form. And it's only possible in the written form in the mass age. If you lived in a hunter-gatherer society, you're fine without writing. Because there's, a, there's still, media, there's still uh, layers of mediation between you and everyone else. You still have the transcendental apparatus of, you know, like the Kantian schema, like is still there, like mediating experience, of course. But you know everybody and they know you and you see each other every day, faults, warts, and all. But we live in a mediated society that takes that word mediated to a whole other level. And in a super highly mediated world, reading is a practice of developing soul regardless of the fact that we are fractured regardless of the fact right medium mediums are across the board very very different and different media different mediums are good for different kinds of tasks and one of the lies of the internet is that all screens are created equal and that every screen you scroll is the same space that every forum, that every Discord server, 
that every channel, that every live chat, it's all the same space. You get to feel like it's all the same space. It's not the same space though, because a, a space that has a specific directive or goal or certain kinds of sets of operating assumptions or reference points in terms of texts, in terms of questions, in terms of problems, in terms of concepts, in terms of thinkers, that changes the space fundamentally. And a book is a different one altogether than what you can get on a screen. And so one of the things that we do is like encourage you to write notes on actual paper as a form of praxis, but also reading actual books as opposed to uh, just skimming PDFs and doing the control F function to jump around, which is, yeah, I mean, it's very uh, addicting. It's very addicting to constantly give, give over to the ADHD mode. Now, a lot of people aren't ADHD, but nonetheless give themselves over to its mode, which is the mode of the attention economy, which is to say, you're just this producer consumer bouncing from one thing to the next in the circle of what Heidegger called falling, which is constituted by a uh, superficial non-committal non -committal curiosity, superficial non-committal curiosity, ambiguity in terms of the understanding of uh, what the possibilities of any given thing really are, never really getting to the bottom of the thing, but still talking about it nonetheless, and the talking about it nonetheless, which we'll call idle talk or idle chatter, which is just passing the word along. What's, what's trending? What's trending? What's trending? What's now? What's now? What's now? What's next? What's next? What's next? No, don't bother getting to the bottom of that. Here's the three things that different kinds of people say. The left says this, the right says that, the center says that. There's your options. Now, uh, form your opinion. Oh, you formed your opinion. Well, it's a little late. We're already on to the next thing. Let's keep going. Keep it moving. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And that's very good for Silicon Valley. That's very good for the state. We're very easy to see. We're very legible to the state when we are simplistic consumer producers, when we are eradicated of all nuance, when we don't have this distance from me and myself, when we don't have this conscious split subject, which is very different from the Lacanian side of things we will be getting into next month. Next month, I'll give an introduction to Lacan and I'll talk about the importance of split subjectivity and the split between me and the it, the drive, right? But this distinction between me and myself, I think, is completely left out of theory internet discourse today. Challenge, find me someone talking about it on the internet, send it to me. I'll wait, but I think it might be the most important thing in our heavily mediated age that is a fractured mass age. Thank you. There, I'll, you're all clapping, so I'll push the button there. I'll only push the button ironically, or if you all are actually clapping, in which case. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll click it. Thank you. Now we can open this up to uh, questions and thoughts, but I wanna give Nance and Ao, Philip and Wukas, um, some encouragement to say something uh, because you were there last year, right? You were there last year and um, you have presentations, you have thoughts, you have testimonies. If you'd like to share them with people who are here, as well as the people on YouTube, we would love to hear from you because right now, this is sort of an advertisement. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you to see the value of CMT, to think about attending once a month and to, to whether you're going to write a piece for this, that'll end up in one of our anthologies or a presentation at the conference, or maybe we'll meet up with you on tour outside of all of that, just at the level of like theory and practice. I'm trying to sell you on not, like where we've been. You didn't miss the boat. The, the, we're just getting started with this whole thing. You can still binge the past lectures if you want to. 
but we've got a whole awesome year ahead of us. And I really hope that uh, some of you are sold on it at this point. You'll want to become subscribers. You'll actually want to be participating. We've made it so that at, at right now, the, the current subscription tiers are all wrong. Um, it's actually uh, tier one gets you access to uh, critical media theory and or CDT, critical doxology and time energy. So there's like this sort of bonus in effect where at tier one, you get access to both of the courses in an ongoing sense. But um, even if you're not able to do it this year and you're just going to try to binge the content next year, uh, that's okay. And, uh, but, but I do want to get, you know, open up the floor for people who are interested, people who are curious, people who have questions, but also starting with, you know, some testimonies. We'll go uh, Nance and then we'll see if uh, AO or Wukas or uh, Philip are going to want to add something. Uh, this topic, this critical media theory topic is probably my favorite topic, probably my favorite cohort to get together with and, and discuss things because I think it permeates all the other topics that I care about. Um, because before we can take any kind of effective action, we first have to understand the situation that we're currently in so that we can, you know, act with, with good information. So we're not just out here throwing shit at, at postmodern walls and seeing what sticks. And of course nothing sticks because the walls aren't even there. Um, I think the the conversation about our relationship to devices is a very popular conversation i think everybody loves to sit around and commiserate um and give examples because i think it maybe it points to something like this shared malaise the shared uh disillusion that we all feel but it also tends to be a very shallow conversation uh, people just kind of go on and on and on and say the same thing over and over again um and I like, I think it has a very real chance at being the last conversation, like that conversation. Oh, the phone, this, and oh, my kids, that, and oh, my old, the old people in my life, this and that, like, it's all just different ways to express, like, I, I feel a lack in my life and I think it's located in my relationship to my devices. Um, and I don't want that to be the last conversation. And I, I think like we, we have to seriously be actually critical and, and really get, get into it. And I mean, trying new things. I like to think of myself as a person who writes, um, but I spend so much time not actually writing, um, but partaking in these conversations and, and actually kind of participating in some of the challenges that Anne, Anne kind of called, called our bluff several times. Uh, and I totally failed multiple times, but I, I had some small successes and, um, it has changed my daily life in a positive way. And, and that's awesome. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I love it. I, I love this conversation. We always come back to this conversation. Um, but I think we're really trying to break through whatever resistance it is that, that keeps it from being just that superficial. Oh, phones. Am I right? Um, I don't know. I I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm stoked. I, we, we read so much dope shit. Um, Virilio and Arendt, um, Lumen, Baudrillard, McLuhan, Postman, like we, the, the texts that we're reading are all great. Um, I love it. I'm, I'm excited to get into it. I can talk. I'm uh, very interested in a space that can explore like what technology is doing to the human body. And so for the uh, upcoming conference, um, I've written a couple plays. Uh, one of them I'm working on right now. It's called Towards a New Prop Master. And it's kind of uh, marrying like, uh, what's the dude's name? Edward Bernays and uh, Eric from um and i think i might look like a little bit at this what's that nazi movie uh oh there's so many zone of interest uh, the zone of interest 
the zone of interest where, where when he's like drive heaving at the end. I don't think that's too much of a spoiler, but just the idea of like, you know, the body is going to have some kind of uh, response to all this. And so that is like a way of seeing if I can get as many people in, in the group and in the conference as possible, just to bring like a little theatricality to it. So we're not all sitting around and like, uh, you know, it's cool. It's cool to like think and do all that stuff, but like to really feel what it's like to be, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to read Michael Easter's book to be like completely uncomfortable talking to someone uh, in front of an audience. That is to say like this discomfort comes uh, from looking up from your phone and just being like, what, what are we doing to our bodies? Um, as we become more and more, as, as Dave was saying with uh, Baudrillard, like mental beings that, you know, just like abstractions on abstractions, like uh, inception for days and, and to come back to uh, the body and be like, we're not, we're not like fully at Wally yet. So I feel like this is an interesting way of kind of bringing a lot of the newest and the most archaic things together to see what that what that friction will create what about any kinds of questions or comments or feedback that anybody might have and if you start to feel stacked up people can use the Raise hand feature, which is if you put your mouse down at the bottom, click on the little carrot beside reactions. And uh, no, not the carrot. Just click on reactions and raise your hand will be an option there. We'll start off with Luke. Yes, thanks for the lecture, first of all. Um, uh, I was really thinking about how you started your talk with your example that you asked your class if anybody saw salt burn and everybody saw them. And then you went into how uh, actually we are now living in uh, fractured times, so non-canonical, but yet at the same time, everybody saw the movie. So could you maybe elaborate a bit more on that? That's a great question. So the way I think of anything that is about humans, whether it's about you know, to saying, a, well, an individual this or, or, or people, generally speaking, or a culture, generally this or that. I just, I go with that basic idea that the exception proves the rule. Um, so, you know, I, I'm never making a universal statement. I'm making a general statement, right? I think sociology, sociological thinking is very accustomed to thinking in general terms, um, not universal terms now philosophy the goal with philosophy is to think like what is the what is universal you know what is universal truth universal good universal whatever uh well yeah but sociologically we we want to ask what is as heidegger would say approximately and for the most part the case and it's it's not an accident that i bring heidegger in here because heidegger and marx are the two main thinkers for me Period, first of all, period. But also, um, oh, I'm not actually showing on the recording here. Let's go ahead and bring myself back here. But uh, Heidegger and Marx are either obviously very different thinkers, but a couple of ways that they're the same um, is that they are sort of over the idea of... Uh, universal universal truths about humans is not like their their goal here sorry i got a little distracted with my my buttons here let's let's, let's i don't want to have a pink light behind me right now and i'm very distracted okay there we go all right so um yeah bo both of them are thinking like what's like they're, they're both trying to do I, I guess it's like a socially contingent or a historically contingent ontology not a, not an ontology of all humans for all time but they they're thinking what is 
what is the way it works here and now? And then they both are thinking, generally speaking, they're both thinking, generally speaking, they're not thinking in terms of like absolute universals. And so, um, I, I, I get, I take a note, note out of their books. And so if I say something about, uh, you know, our time and sort of the zeitgeist of the moment and what's characteristic of it, um, the reason I started with the, like, oh, look, everyone actually had seen something is because it's the exception that proves the rule. The fact that it was so surprising, the, the fact that it was so exceptional brings into contrast, oh, this is not normal for us. We don't normally get to all get together with a bunch of strangers and we all saw the same thing. Um, whereas in the past, it was the other way around. If somebody hadn't uh, read Homer or the, the Bible, it was like, that's weird. And it was so weird that it was, uh, it was bringing to light the, uh, the sort of canonical basis of intelligibility that everybody shared. Yeah, great question. We've got time for like maybe two more here before we close out. And Daniel, I'm going to just say, I don't know if you've got anything, man. I, I, I brought up sociology. Um, you're obviously like the sociology guy here besides Anne. You're, you're both the sociology guys here. But um, yeah, uh, just wondering if you got anything. Oh, well, I, it's a wonderful presentation. Um, I think I really do like also this kind of idea. Um, I would say something that is of great interest in sociology is shared intelligibility. And every, if everyone can't even like own the same movies or books anymore, there's a way in which we don't have shared intelligibility. And what I think what's really important about identifying that in the way that media technologies um, become part of the very uh, terrain of sociology and thus fragment shared intelligibility. Shared intelligibility and the possibility of changing the conditions of possibility are really strongly tied together. And if you don't have shared intelligibility, then before you can even, you know, this whole idea of like, well, what would it look like today to really focus on changing conditions of possibility? Well, you could almost in a way say that the offensive attack against that strategy is precisely removing shared intelligibility and fragmenting focus, right? And that is why I think the conversation is all kind of tied together as well. I think also with sociology, like if I think someone like a reef, Berger, et cetera, so forth on the idea that human beings, and then I'll stop. Um, if we If we don't have givens, anything that we can just take as given, then we tend to be overwhelmed with existential anxiety because when I encounter you, so for example, a way to put this, if when I encounter you, there's a 90% chance that you know what Final Fantasy VI is and you know that it's one of the greatest RPGs of all time, then I have a connection with you when I interact, right? But if I run into you and I can't even like assume that, then gradually and slowly, it's just too uncomfortable and awkward. And so I gradually just kind of back away because I don't have those givens, right? But then we atomize, then we don't relate, then we don't connect, and we go to our phone and scroll, right? And so the and then of course now the the kind of negation sublation of this is when you have givens, uh, you know, there's the danger of thoughtlessness because we all assume we think the same, and then we get sucked into a mass movement. What today it means is we have to learn the capacity to encounter someone without givens and see it as a creative opportunity. And that sort of response to creative opportunity needs to become a basis of a kind of sociological encounter that needs to be part of conditions of possibility because changing conditions of possibility can no longer be assumed on grounds of shared intelligibility. So there's something about the encounter, which I think does parallel the encounter with a book, a difficult book, a difficult text. I don't know what this means. How do I think about it? So I think these things are all connected and I appreciate the conversation. Awesome. And if, 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 until people raise their hands, I'm going to keep picking on people. Um, so Wukas, we'll, we'll go with you first. And then Cadell, I think I'm going to give you a, I, we definitely want to hear from you. And you were saying, I didn't get to follow the chat very much. I'm hoping that somebody who was very active in the chat can share about some of the stuff that I missed because for the last like 45 minutes, I, I basically missed everything. Um, but Cadell had said like, fuck or something like that at some point. And I'd love to hear him elaborate on that, but also Cadell, I'll want you to be able to give a plug for the live events you're doing at philosophy portal, since we are making it so that we don't, uh, 
we're not doing these at the same time as one another, which we were doing for a little bit there. And now we're working around one another's schedules. And so I want Cadell to tell you all about what's going on with the sacred as a theme over at Philosophy Portal this month. But first, Ukas, take it away, man. I wanted to say that I'm stoked that we are going into Nick Sernicek because I want to delve into some accelerationists who don't summon like ancient monsters in their in their basements. But also the last eight months of CMT were like an absolute blast. And today you said, Dave, that this is about the critique of the current situation more than the, like immediately delving into a action and change but to be fair like the lectures last year they had a real practical change on my like daily existence like we had those tasks and they like the do not disturb button in my phone it really it was it really changed my behavior so yeah if if you want to if someone wants to sign up for this year's cmt why haven't you done it already man do it Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, we pass. Hey, did you want me to jump in, Dave? Yeah, man. Okay. Yeah, I think I I just caught caught the the end of that, but um, um, yeah, the month. You want you want me to talk specifically about the month of the sacred? Yeah, that or plus more plus, well. I you had said you had said something in the chat like fuck and I didn't actually know what you were talking about because I was not following along with joking. the chat at the time. Okay. <laughs> I was joking because you called us all lonely fucks and I was like, oh fuck. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, so th yeah, th no, that was just a joke, but um no great. Yeah, no, it was it was great to be here. I was able to follow along the, the whole time. I just missed a little bit there because because Audrey walked in and I yeah, was talking to her. Um, well, and you're also very busy because you're at the Freud Museum there in Paris. So I'm at the Freud Museum. Yeah, they gave me the keys. Yeah, exactly. No, but we're 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 sort of we're sort of this is sort of a coordinate coordinated time coordinated timing, right? So so I've got the the philosophy portal member space, um, and we do we do live weekly events every Sunday. Uh, now at 8:30 p.m. CET, which is about 40 minutes from now, and and the, you know that coordination means that we can sort of uh, collaborate more easily, and so sort of I can I can come to your events more regularly, and you can come to my event events more regularly, and um, yeah, looking forward to that a lot. This month we're focusing on the sacred. The basic idea at, at Philosophy Portal with the member space is that every month we're going to be focusing on a different theme of the month. And then there are four different events that will give you a, a different window into that concept. Um, so tonight we're inviting on uh, Andrew Davis, who's a professor at the Center of Process Studies, to talk about the distinction between human and cosmic value. Um, and just to sort of give you a sense of, of how interesting the whole month can be if you sort of, you know, engage with 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 each monthly event is, you know, I opened up the month with a focus on on the sacred with a look at the history of um, basically human civilization and our relationship to the sacred and specifically situated that within the context of the modern world as kind of like this process of profanation, this con this uh this this process of transgressing the sacred. Um and then Andrew Davis is gonna come in tonight and he's gonna kind of blow that entire framework apart because he's gonna be talking about the distinction between human and cosmic value, because pre-modern human consciousness didn't have any understanding of the cosmos in the way that moderns had understanding of the cosmos and so you know we're just basically playing around with a whole bunch of different ways to see that same concept and you know the first two months have been really uh really an interesting experiment and excited to to see that continue and um yeah that that's really the gist of it thanks man yeah actually cadell uh had me on last month and that was awesome i, I talked about time energy and actually i i shared i got permission to share the the lecture I gave on time energy to the philosophy portal folks, uh, at, uh, well, I got to share it with my own critical doxology and time energy cohort from this, uh, year. So uh, that that's cool. Let me just add, add, add one thing. We're actually doing a time energy book club this month. So we, we had Dave on for time energy last month and we're going to do a book club this month as well. So that, that, that's something to look forward to as well. 
Awesome. All right, everybody. I think with that, we're going to close this out. I really appreciate you all for being here. Uh, oh, no, shit. I'm sorry. I said I was going to close this out. I, I, I'm i going to give Anne the floor here at the end. I'm, I, now, if she if she needs to get back to the computer, she's right there. Perfect. So, uh, Anne, it's, the floor is yours. Um, you can give everybody their assignment for the month. I know you're not prepared for that because we didn't talk about it ahead of time, but you can take your favorite one from last year or whatever you have in mind. To, but also just your closing thoughts on, on the, the lecture, on people's uh, feedback, on the whole thing. It, you can close it out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the turnout for this course and the fact that we have like people coming back for round two, people who have already kind of explored the previous lectures is just really exciting because I, I love the interactiveness of this particular course as opposed to just like a regular lecture. I think it's it definitely like everyone can think of something in their own lives that this relates to directly and and the big ideas that everyone has contributed has just been amazing. Um, and like the presentations that we had these last couple months from Philip, Ao, Nance, Rudy, Lucas, like all wonderful. And so I really look forward to like getting to, you know, hear the continued reflections from those I already know and lots of new faces, lots of new participants for you all to have the space to share your own ideas and reflections. Um, this is just like a super great dedicated cohort and that's really exciting. So just thank you all for being here. Um, like I know for the CDT lectures, one theory underground fellow traveler has shared that like she doesn't love like self-help type books and there's definitely room to be critical of these self-help type books but I think I just appreciate you all like hearing me out at my kind of lecture where I, I I buy in I buy in for the month and we see what good we can extract from the book while being critical of it um and I don't think anyone's out here like giving impassioned lectures on digital literacy by Cal Newport so I just appreciate everyone in terms of an assignment for next month, besides if you can doing the readings that will be on the syllabus, I know Dave is doing Lacan. I think the first one is the first like popular book is called The Comfort Crisis. Um, so if you can listen to that, read the introduction. If you have the time and energy, read the whole thing. Um, but if not, like that is never required, like Dave said. Um, I would say the main thing, like the assignment would be choose one of the books, the like popular books that I highlighted. And again, listen to it, read the introduction, uh, something like read, get a P AI PDF summarizer to give you, you know, an essay about it. Um, so you can have some familiarity with one of these texts that really interested you. That's part one. So just kind of diving into some readings and part two would be get a notebook like the one Nance had, the one Nance showed. And when you can do some reflecting, I found I started my new year saying, I'm going to write in a journal every single day. And that like perfection, like I got to do it every single day held me back. So now I do it when I can and when I'm inspired and I find that I do it more and more. So I'm not going to say reflect every day, but when you can, when you think about it, have a, a CMT dedicated journal, or maybe you already have a notebook and have a CMT dedicated pen color and just start some like reflections on your own media habits, your own social media technology consumption habits. Um, and that that is what you got to do. And we'll meet again in April. So thank you. Got to get back to the stove now, though. <laughs> uh, last quick little insertion here is just that. Uh, don't subscribe via the app. The app is uh, not the way to do it because uh, I'm sorry to say uh, it's we're going to the app is too slow. It's too buggy. It doesn't do the things that I needed it to do. And so it's going to get phased out here pretty soon. Um, also, I really like the comment. Uh, I don't know. He's, he was probably joking, but Wukas said he, he said, I actually want Nance's notebook. And I said, I'd be happy to publish it. I just wanted you all to know I'm not joking. I actually think like there's something there's something to 
like some good journaling that's very worthwhile. And um, if you want to read a, a non-traditional kind of book about the deep state and the Freedom of Information Act and how hard it is to actually get your hands on documents that have been released um, or, or were supposed to be released when they reflect poorly on the, the United States or the CIA, um, check out the book called Baseless. And it's cool because the way it's written is like as a journal every day. He just talks about, he talks about taking his dog on a walk, doing this, doing that. But then he's also talking about his, you know, this, the ongoing emailing with the, 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 the Freedom of Information Act people trying to get certain documents about, you know, was chemical warfare used on China during this period of a drought that they had, you know, what, you know, and, and then he'd sit there and talk about the reportings of this, that, and the other thing and how, and how they're evaded. Anyway, it's a way of playing with the medium, uh, and actually like taking a sort of more journalist, journalistic, but not in the journalist sense, but like in the sense of like, it's your journal that you're writing, but doing it as a researcher. And I, I encourage you all as critical media theory researchers to treat your, uh, your journal, not just as like, oh, you know, I used my phone this much and here's something I'm doing this, this month to try to use it less or whatever, but also like, oh, I'm also thinking about this thinker and how this thinker relates to this thing in our actual life. And with that, thank you everybody so much. Hope to see you at the next one. Take care. Peace. All right. So. Here at the end, I'm just going to give you a quick little crash course on how to subscribe, assuming that you want to be a part of these monthly lecture sessions. Also, discussion groups. The discussion groups is arguably the best part, but they wouldn't be nearly as good if it wasn't for the fact that the people in those discussions had seen these lectures and then had some time to think about it, right? Much less having tried on, like, or tried to apply one of the uh, experiments that Anne assigns. Those assignments and the discussions that revolve around them, some of the best stuff for sure. In terms of all of the discussion group facilitation I've been involved with over the last, at this point, over a decade of organizing, I would say that these CMT as well as CDT uh, discussions, that they're amazing. They're, they're why I do this. Like they're so rewarding. They really are like, we really get a lot out of them. Both, both me and Ann, like we just have fantastic conversations throughout the week because of these events. And this is also where I need to insert the other thing that I forgot to say, which is just that this is a buy one, get one for couples. We really encourage people to, to bring their significant other. Uh, and that's also something I know that, uh, Cadell has also put into effect at flossy portal but really like if you have the time and the energy and the the finances to do both and and to and to bring your significant other and to really like make this like kind of like your brain church of the month think of it like a gym membership but for your mind I'd highly recommend but with that let me walk you through how to get set up as a subscriber so never mind this outdated website with the old theme and the old logo and all just never mind all of that stuff and also never mind the fact that the tu subscription tiers don't really match what they're going to provide in fact just just think about it this way the more money you spend on this the better it's going to be and uh but if you're at tier one right now the special going offer is instead of just having access to CMT or CDT, which is what it currently says, if you look at this, uh, the current way that it says this, it says uh, tier one, one of the two ongoing seminars plus, plus one pass course per month. And then at tier two, you get both ongoing seminars. Well, right now, um, because the website is crap and I'm in the middle of reformatting everything, and I don't really know what's going to happen with the tiers and how it's all going to look in a month from now. Just know if you sign up for tier one right now, you get access to both. Um, if you have a bigger income, if you have a bigger salary, if you have deeper pockets, you should try to treat this a little bit more like your tithe and just do 
of whatever uh whatever your your money that you use to spend on things is i'm not saying of your total income um but of your you know just just go go bigger if you are bigger but if you are like the majority of people with your underground and you're strapped for cash um just go for tier one it's not a big deal you'll still get access to amazing things all right so don't worry about it um right here tier one uh you gotta select it it, it kind of defaults to showing tier three which is a lot more expensive but at tier one um yeah it's 30 bucks a month click sign up now uh you can pay with uh google pay uh if you go through the whole sign up process and come out the other side um you'll get a special email from me welcoming you um, you'll get to be a part of the behind the scenes alternative that we're using to the website right now, uh, for communication and for accessing the courses. And, uh, you'll get to attend the second and fourth Sunday events here at Theory Underground, which happen at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern. And, you know, it was, 1800 uh cet but daylight savings just happened and so now it's uh 1700 so just always in what in doubt you double check your time against the eastern time zone that i give and that'll be how we go about it all right and with that hope to see you there thanks i'm tired i need to finish editing this video and go to bed it's been a long day so thank you for being here. Also, shout out to the patrons. Later. Take a minute, I can get my motion before you mind! <laughs> <laughs>